Good, okay. Um, so uh, welcome back everybody. And uh, I just wanted to, a uh, little bit of a shout out here. Uh, we, since we've started our, uh, our YouTube channel, uh, we have attracted an international audience. So uh, uh, normally speaking uh, on, a, <clears throat> on any given Sunday, uh, we will have uh, uh, several countries from Europe. Uh, Greece seems to always tune in. Uh, today, we have the Philippines and uh, Sweden uh, watching us. Uh, we've gotten live streams from, uh, I'm sorry, audiences uh, uh, from, uh, from regions of Africa, inside Russia, and uh, also from Texas. Is Texas a foreign country? I don't know. They think that they are a foreign country, I think, right? I said. <laughs> um, but uh, again, the way that the afternoon session will go then is um, we'll just take a very, very short, uh, just stretch break every uh, hour, I think yeah. you said, every hour. And then we're going to leave a little bit of time at the end, at least an hour, I think, at the end, because uh, I'm sure that you have questions. Uh, and when it was very nice to, to hear in lunch uh, that we were kind of all sitting around the table and we were talking and some things we were saying was, I didn't know we believed that. <laughs> and then other things we were saying was, I thought we did believe that. So you have definitely enlightened okay. us into some things that we believe. So at this point, let me go Thank ahead and Father. turn it over and again. Thank you, Father. Will you shut the door so it doesn't yeah. remain open? Thank you, Father. And yes, lunch was interesting for me because um, I appreciated people confirming what I had thought, it's nice to hear that people realize, that people sort of, um, as I said, confirm some of the statements that I made, such as the idea that sports on Sunday mornings have become a very big problem for our youth, that people, and some people actually, have chosen when they were said, listen, why you should, you know, come to church, why are you taking your kids for sports on Sunday mornings? And then they decided just to stop coming to church. And so they to choose between Christ and sports, and they chose sports, which is pretty shocking. But uh, and at the same time, we're not, not entirely surprised, right? Because this is what our culture is presenting as a good thing. And not only that, I don't think that a, an Orthodox Christian that chooses to take their, involve their children in sports on Sunday mornings thinks that they're choosing between Christ and sports. They would say, I'm still a good Christian. I'm a good person. God loves me. I haven't done anything wrong. That's what they think. They're, they're, they're lacking the phronema to recognize that, in fact, that is the choice that they have made. That they have made, and worse off for their children, this is the choice that they have made to choose not to introduce um, church and Christ as something so essential that everything else becomes secondary. So I was teaching a course at the university called Early Christianity. And um, the, the, the things that the students had to read, the readings of the students, were all writings from early Christianity. And a, some of them, at least a couple of them, were accounts of martyrdoms. And students could not understand them. They were flabbergasted that people would prefer to die rather than deny Christ. And that really shows you how people just value this life in this world, and they have such a short view. They're not thinking about eternal life. The other thing that came up at lunch was the idea of this kind of trend toward trying to Judaize the Christian faith, Christians doing things like celebrating Passover. So um, I did mention that, but I didn't say what's so wrong with it, besides the fact that the early church these, these, the, the decision to transform Jewish feasts into a Christian understanding. The church didn't drop Passover. We have a Passover. We say, Pascha, Kiriu, Pascha. We have a Passover, but it's the Passover of the Lord. It's not Moses' Passover. Moses' Passover was only for this life. It was to bring the, the Hebrews out of slavery in Egypt. But Jesus' Passover is a Passover from sin and death to eternal life. That's what the Passover is. And very, very early on, the church recognize that, you see? And the church made that transition in the very beginning. Paul is talking about that. Paul says, Christ, our Paschal Lamb, has been crucified, has been sacrificed. So 
This idea that later on the church stopped celebrating Passover is ridiculous. They do, they did, and they do celebrate Passover today. We do. But it's the Passover of the Lord. It's understanding that Jesus is the fulfillment of Judaism. So this idea that somehow by Judaizing a church or Judaizing yourself, that means bringing back Jewish customs. You're going back to the early church. You're, you're not. Because those apostles were dropping those things. The apostles were letting go of Jewish customs as they grew in their understanding of Jesus Christ. At any rate, so now as we continue, we're going to talk about characteristics of Orthodox phronima, why it's important for our salvation, something that we've already sort of touched on. But Let's turn first to, again, the question of authority. I think that's very important. Authority in the church. What stands as authority um, within your faith tradition? Because that is what guides you. So it's easy for people to say, well, it's this or it's that. Scripture and tradition is what the Catholics say. The scriptures alone are what Protestants say. But the, uh, no, neither of those is exactly true as it has been developed in Western Christianity. So let's start with what is accepted as authority, because that is what determines the beliefs and the attitude of any particular religion. So of course, for the Catholics, it's Rome. Well, what is authority? Scripture and tradition. Not exactly. It's scripture and tradition as mediated through, as interpreted through the Bishop of Rome. And that has changed drastically over time. The early church, first of all, did not even teach Roman supremacy. The idea that Peter is the first pope and that he is in charge of the whole church, that didn't exist in the early church. We know that historically to be true. So to give you an example of what, how this is expressed, there, there are all kinds of justifications and explanations and interpretations that are given by Catholics to support this, okay? Lots of them. And we would say what? We would say, we don't care. I don't care what scriptures you quote at me, why you say there really should be a pope and the church should be under one person. It doesn't matter because the early church did not function like that. So it really doesn't matter to us how logical their explanation or justification appears to them. What we always do is look at what did the early church believe, how did they live, and that's what we do. So one of my students was arguing with me about, well, not arguing, we're having discussion about the papacy and how the, the Bishop of Rome was really the head of the church and that sort of a thing. I, I don't really have a problem with Catholics saying that now that is the truth for them today, but just don't say that this is the way it was in the early church. There's absolutely no evidence. And they couldn't have functioned that way. We know for certain that they didn't, and they couldn't have functioned with one head, centralized head for the whole you know, Mediterranean area. That was impossible. But I said to him, I said, you know what? If this is how the early church was, that Peter was the head of the church, and Rome was the head of the church, and they all decisions came from Rome, and everybody recognized the authority of Rome over the whole church, we would believe that more than you, okay, because that's what we are. We believe in whatever the early church did, okay? So they never, they never followed this kind of Roman supremacy. It did not exist in the early church. It didn't even exist when Peter was alive. When there was a controversy in the church, they didn't say, Peter, you're the rock of the church. What do you say we should do? They didn't even do that when Peter was alive. So if Peter didn't have that kind of authority while he was alive, how could his successors, even if he wasn't, you know, even if he was the Bishop of Rome, um, how could they have that kind of authority? But there's a lot of arguments that are made, you know. And one of them, for example, is that, um, that the, the kingdom of heaven has to have a king. So there's a very strong emphasis on the monarchy of the papacy. And so he, there, there has to be one person who's in charge. So, of course, he's the vicar of Christ on earth. You can't say that Jesus is the king. Well, they say, yeah, but there's got to be somebody on earth. So he's the vicar of Christ on earth. And this, of course, is based on human reasoning, not on apostolic tradition. Paul never talked about that. Paul talked about Christ as the head of the church. 
We never say that somebody in our, no matter who he is, no matter how important the bishop is, is the vicar of Christ on earth. He's in charge of the church on earth. There isn't one bishop at all that's in charge of the entire Orthodox church. But this is what they say, scriptures and tradition, scripture and tradition, but all of those are explained through the lens of Rome, which issues a lot of documents. They issue a lot of documents, different kinds of papal documents, different documents from different Vatican departments, and then they explain the teaching, the decision, and then they'll quote a little snippet of a verse from the Bible, a little snippet from one of the fathers, to make it look like they're in line with the ancient tradition, but they're not. Because, because they believe that the authority is in Rome, that authority, the decisions, the traditions, the teaching, it can change. Okay, and it has, dramatically. So for Protestants, what's the authority? Of course, the scriptures alone, but we've already shown why that's a very weak premise and really untenable, because that is actually a human tradition. Where does it say in the Bible, if that's your authority, the scriptures alone, where does it say that in the Bible? It does not say that in the Bible. The idea that it's the scriptures alone is actually a tradition of men, the very thing that we're criticized for following. It is the scriptures, and it, not only is it a tradition that was created by Martin Luther, but it is also something that isn't actually honest because it's not the scriptures alone, it's the scriptures as interpreted by Martin Luther, John Calvin, Joel Olstein, Billy Graham, or whoever else is uh, the preacher. So it's the, it's the scriptures as interpreted by someone. So what do the scriptures say is authority? The scriptures themselves say that the authority is in the apostles and in the church. So if we look, again, reading the New Testament through the eyes of the early church, that's with an orthodox phonema, it's obvious that the apostles were the authority of the church. So St. Paul calls upon his apostolic authority again and again and again. St. Paul orders his people to do something or to stop doing something on the basis of his apostolic authority, you see? So if you think about it, this is what he does. He says, stop doing this. I order you, cast this person out, or do this, or don't do that. And then he charges them on the basis of his apostolic authority. And so the early church had the apostolic authority, and the church itself is the authority because it is the continuation of the apostles. The bishops now for us have the role that the apostles had. So tradition should not be a dirty word as it is for, for Protestants, unfortunately, because apostolic tradition was the foundation of the church. Christ gave his authority to the apostles. Of course, they received it at Pentecost, but there was a special authority for the leadership when Christ breathed on them after the resurrection and said, receive the Holy Spirit. So the, the Lord created the church and left it in the charge and the custody of the apostles. So the scriptures themselves, what do they say is the pillar and ground of the truth? What is the foundation of the truth? The scriptures say it's the church. That is the ground of the truth. And that's what the Lord gave us. So when we follow the church, we are following what Christ established. So we, as Orthodox Christians, are supposed to conform ourselves to it, okay? Not trying to change it. And this is, again, something that I don't mean to sound overly critical of, of Catholics. I actually find them very fascinating because I will hear Catholics talk, and there, there's something that they don't like about their church. There's a lot of things many of them don't like about their church. And so I'm, I kind of said, well, why are you a Catholic? Because I want to change it. And that's the response. I want to change it. We have to change the church. Okay, of course, now you have very traditional Catholics who want to change it. They want to go back to the way it was before. And then you have these very progressive Catholics. They want to change it, and they want to have things that they don't have now. Okay? But this is their idea. The church has to be changed. I'm going to reform it. I'm going to make it better. I have a better idea. 
In the Orthodox faith, we never think that we know better than the church, or we shouldn't, okay? It is we that need to change to conform to the church. And so the church knows right. The church knows best. And we are the ones who are supposed to try to come to an understanding of what that is. And if we think that we know better, we have to ask ourselves, why does the church do this? Why does the church teach this? Because what the church has is what it received from the Lord. And even though it doesn't always make sense to us, there is a wisdom in that that we often don't realize or aren't aware of or don't appreciate until we're at a different stage in our life. So the church has not changed much because the church has preserved these apostolic teachings. And the reason why we preserve them, again, is not dedication to tradition itself. We're not worshiping tradition. We keep it because that's what Christ gave to the apostles, and that's what makes saints. This is why how we are sanctified. And I don't know if you noticed this. In the Divine Liturgy this morning, I was reading one of the prayers. Father was reading the inaudible prayers and asking Christ to sanctify us before communion. Sanctify us. He doesn't say, take away our sins, although there's some of that language too, but mostly we are asking Christ to sanctify us, to make us holy. The church is the vehicle for accomplishing that. The church knows what works because we've had thousands and thousands and thousands of saints. If you live like this, if you think like this, if you follow this way of life, you too can be sanctified. You can become a saint. I don't become a saint by figuring out on my own how to do that. I do that by following this well-worn path. It's a narrow path because Jesus said the path is narrow. The way to salvation is narrow. The kingdom of heaven, is very few people find it. But you know what? That path may be narrow because it's difficult, but it's very well-worn. We follow the examples of the saints, and this is why we have confidence in the church because we have experienced that. And we know that what the church is teaching us is true. So what are some of the characteristics of Orthodox phronima? Preservation of apostolic tradition. As I mentioned, this is probably the number one thing. Scripture and tradition are not two different things. And so if you ever say, well, we have scripture and tradition, you're copying the Catholic line. It's better to say, apostolic tradition, what the apostles receive from the Lord, if you have to explain it because somebody gets turned off immediately by the word tradition, say, we follow what the apostles receive from the Lord. Then you're not using the T word. Okay, maybe that's one way to handle that. But what Catholics did in response to the Protestant Reformation, when the Protestants were saying sola scriptura, the scriptures alone, the Catholics responded scripture and tradition. So some of the Orthodox have copied that. The problem is that scripture is tradition. Scripture is part of tradition. Scripture is simply the written record of some of those apostolic teachings. So it's not really good to divide them as though they're somehow something different. What else is characteristic of Orthodox Phonema? This unity of the faith, this consistency in all aspects of the faith that this comes from our phronima and it reinforces our phronima. There's a strong, there's a united perspective and beliefs regardless of when or where we live in the world and what time period we we live in. So again, if you grew up in the church the way I did, we don't always fully appreciate the chaos out there in the world. And it is chaos as people are trying to find the church, make the church, recover the church, figure out what the early church was like. Absolute chaos. I'll tell you a little story. We were in, I was in one of the parishes. I think this was even before I was married. So there was a, we were having a general assembly meeting. And the, this, is a, this is a meeting of the entire parish to discuss the business of the parish. I don't really remember what the subject was, but it was getting a little bit heated. And of course, they were talking about the budget of the church. So one of the things that we see in orthodoxy is that the lay people are very involved in the church. 
And in that respect, we're kind of like the Protestants. There's a lot of lay involvement. But we also have clergy, and we have hierarchs, which is like the Catholic Church. So we really have something that is neither this nor that, but a little bit of both, and a lot of neither. But one of the things that happened at this meeting is people got very uh, upset about the budget and things that were proposed for what they wanted to spend. I don't remember what. Well, I was sitting next to a young man who had recently become Orthodox, and I was a little worried about this because I thought he might be scandalized by these Greeks arguing about money. Okay? And um, he started smiling. And I said, why are you smiling? He said, they're only arguing about money. And I said, what do you mean? He said, the last church I went to, they were arguing about doctrine. Because in many of these Protestant churches, they don't have any foundation in the dogma of the church. So they have to discuss all over again, is Jesus Christ the Son of God? And how is he the Son of God? And how is he both human and divine? And they argue over doctrine. We don't have that problem. So that was, that was very surprising to me. So I'm not you know, out there the way some other people are who've come from that kind of a background. But believe me, the unity of the faith is very strong in orthodoxy, much, much, much more than anywhere else, even though we have our little quibbles and squabbles between us. That's nothing compared to the disunity in the rest of Christendom. So orthodoxy also might, it might, it might surprise people that I speak about the unity of the faith because Catholics look at us and say, oh my gosh, how do, you, how do you live like this? This is utter chaos. You've got this patriarch in Moscow and you've got somebody in Serbia and you've got this Greek archdiocese and you have the ecumenical patriarch and you have the Church of Cyprus and then they're all, and sometimes they have their little squabbles, right? Among the hierarchs of the most, the highest in the church. And so they look at that and they say, that's absolute chaos, and this is why Rome is better. They have one person in charge, one person, there's a kind of a clear chain of command. But that's exactly the problem. We don't want to be under anyone's thumb. And the early church never functioned like that. The unity of the church was not based on a place like Rome. The unity of the church was based on the teachings of the church, that is, all Christians had the same basic beliefs and practices. And they got those from the apostles. The apostles were united in what they said about Jesus Christ. And that's why we are united. This is what makes our phronima, because we have the same teachings. So it doesn't require us to have one head of the whole church in the whole world. And even if they have little arguments between them or little disagreements, that doesn't really affect the church ultimately. And it doesn't affect our teachings. So our unity is theological. It's not based on adherence or allegiance to one particular city, and that is Rome. So for Protestants, they would say, well, there's, no, there's a unity of the church, but it's in heaven. They've there are so many different thousands of kinds of Protestants. Divisions are normal for them. They rationalize it away. They don't recognize that the disunity in the Protestant world is because of sola scriptura, which is their essential teaching. The essential teaching is the scriptures alone. I've always already shown that that is not how the early church functioned because there were no Christian scriptures and everything was done orally. But they insist on that because... Essentially, the Protestant movement is anti-Catholic. So they have to reject tradition and, and sacraments and a lot of other things because they want to always maintain this opposition to what they perceive as Catholic innovation. So Protestants will actually say, well, there's lots of different churches, and they're all okay, as long as you're not Catholic. Now they add the Orthodox, now that they kind of know who we are. They throw us in there. You shouldn't be Orthodox or Catholic, but you can be any kind of Protestant because we all kind of believe the same thing, and they actually compare it to different restaurants. And so, of course, you can go from this place to this place to this place to this place because it's all just the same food at different restaurants. It's a, and the different flavors of Christianity. There's no recognition that the early church never functioned like this. You want to be like the early church? The early church was decentralized because 
you didn't have modern communication. So the church in Athens and the church in Corinth and the church in Thessalonica and the church in Philippi, they are one church. But not because they came under the umbrella of one person or one uh, Episcopal see. There were one church because they had the same faith. And that's what St. Paul is saying. One Lord, one faith, one baptism. So they were united on the basis of their faith. That's why we as Orthodox have to be sure that we fight very, very hard to preserve Orthodox Christianity. And we do not allow things to change it, even when it seems logical, okay? We know that this is how the early church functioned. And you know how we know? Because we have statements in the early fathers of the church that talk about this. For example, Irenaeus of Lyon talks about, he, he wrote against heresies. There were lots of heresies. And he says that this was, he was writing like around the year 185, 190. So this is second century, very early. And he said that if the, the way to tell if something is true or if it's heresy, that's a false teaching of a serious nature, is whether or not the apostles taught it. If it was taught by the apostles, it's true. If it was not taught by the apostles, if it's an innovation, it's false. So he mentions Christians who lived on the outskirts of the Roman Empire, barbarian peoples. This is what they called them. They, they didn't speak Greek. So they were called barbarians. So these are people who not only didn't speak Greek or Latin, they didn't even have a written language. They have a language because they were speaking to each other, but they didn't have anything in writing. And yet there were Christians in those places, in Gaul, in places that were now France and Germany. These people, he said, if you go there and you try to teach them something or tell them something that they were not taught already, they will reject it, even though they don't have a written language. So the thing that united the Christians in the early church was the same phronima and the same beliefs and the same practices. So, um, so this is the basis of the unity of our faith. And it does not depend upon any one personality, any one person. It doesn't depend on any particular see. We don't have allegiance to you know, the ecumenical patriarchate, the ecumenical patriarch, is the bishop who's the leading bishop for the Orthodox in dia dia diaspora, and we respect him, etc. But we don't look at him the way Catholics look at the Pope, right? I was at the house of um, my, uh, my godson. He became an Orthodox Christian. I baptized him, and he married this Catholic girl from a very devout family. And I went to their house, and there was a refrigerator with a magnet with a picture of the Pope. And I thought, wow, this is really a Catholic house. And that was like, I was thinking, I don't think there are any refrigerator magnet, magnets of Patriarch Bartholomew or any, or the, I mean, that just, we might have the saints or our church or something, but this really shows this kind of cult adherence to one person. Whoever happens to be elected to occupy the seat of Peter, as they call it, okay? Which is just mind-blowing because you can see, or you should be able to see, how dangerous that is. And this is the reason why the Catholic Church has changed tremendously because a pope gets an idea and he introduces it and gradually takes root, and then another pope adds to that, another pope adds to that, and another pope adds to that. And this is why there's a tremendous departure between orthodoxy and the Catholic Church. It's not our doing, but it's because the popes had all of this authority. How could that happen in orthodoxy? No, because if one bishop steps out of line, the others put him back in line, or they remove him. And so even though it seems chaotic to the outside, there's a kind of protection that this system of not having one leader affords us, okay? We don't have one person in authority. All the bishops are equal. Whenever they meet to have a discussion, everybody has a vote. No one dominates over everybody else. It's harder that way 
it's much more difficult and occasionally we have little squabbles between some of the hierarchs in the Orthodox Church, but we don't have to worry about one person taking the church in an entirely different direction, which is what has happened with the monarchial papacy, okay, this idea of kind of earthly power. So how do we have the unity of the faith? We have it through our fronima. Catholics have their documents. The Orthodox have their fronima, which is based on apostolic tradition. The Protestants have the scriptures alone, and that doesn't work. As a matter of fact, that's become the source of division among the Protestants. If you're saying the scriptures alone, then you should be able to point to where the scriptures support what you're saying, and everybody thinks that they can defend their teachings by the scriptures. So the orthodox unity is not dependent upon one see, it's not dependent upon the scriptures alone, but on the consistent use of ancient sources. And here's how that works. We have the same stable authority from beginning to the end. Of course we have the scriptures, they're very important. But the scriptures and their understanding and their interpretation and the spirituality of the church as it has been expressed by the fathers of the church. So why are they so important? Because, not because the fathers by themselves are authority, but the fathers stand as authority for us because they had the phronima of the church. They preserved the apostolic phronima, and when we see that, we recognize it, and we read them, and this reinforces our phronima. So when I, as an Orthodox theologian, go to write a book, I start reading the fathers. I have the scriptures, and then I also read the fathers. What did they say about this? So I go back to the earliest. I start with the earliest ones. I start with Ignatius and Justin Martyr and Irenaeus and Hippolytus. I start with the earliest fathers, and then I come to the closer times. And so they're all saying pretty much the same thing. All right, there's a consistency in the fathers of the church. Why? Because they had the Orthodox Phronima. So this means that when I sit down to read and, or to write a book, I am relying on those people who relied on the people before them, who read the people who lived before them, who read the people who lived before them, who, and you go all the way back to the time of the apostles. So can you see that this is a consistent stream of tradition and we are drinking from the same stream that hasn't changed. It's coming from the Lord through the apostles. It's coming down to us through the fathers, but they're not changing it. They're not adding to it. They are simply presenting it in their own way for their own times. So the consistent use of these ancient sources shapes Orthodox phonema, also the divine liturgy. We're, we're praying the same liturgy that all these fathers before us prayed. We're doing, we have the same sacraments. We have the same prayers. We have the same hymns of all of those early fathers, okay? And so this shapes our way of thought, okay? It shaped their mind, and when we enter into that way of life, it shapes our minds too, okay? So the faith of the fathers, the phronima of the fathers is the mind of the church. And today there are people who are recognizing that they want to kind of support their ideas with the fathers. And so what's really interesting for me is that today a lot of Protestants are starting to read the fathers. Some of them end up orthodox, because as soon as you start to really read the fathers, you realize that it's hard to be Protestant and continue with, uh, with that mentality when you see how the early church really was. So what do we see? Well, we see Catholics quoting the fathers a little bit in their documents to support what they say, little snippets of the fathers. Protestants are starting to read the fathers and they want to show that their teachings were found in the early church. So they find some statement by the fathers, they lift it out of context and they present it. I've had people tell me this. Oh, they quoted from this saint, I don't know who it was, that seems to be promoting substitutionary atonement or something like that. And you know, if you take it out of context and you read just this little portion, 
you might get that idea, but that's artificial. It's highly intellectual. It's not just that the father said this one thing, then you can take it out, pluck it out, and use it like a, you know, a bullet point to support this particular teaching. The fathers taught and they lived in the manner of the apostles. They taught the same beliefs as the apostles. So we do the same thing, and when we read the fathers, this helps to shape our phronima. So what else characterizes orthodox phronima? A lack of definitions and documents. This is very surprising to people. People are often looking for something, especially Protestants, they're looking for some way to define orthodoxy. And guess what? We really don't like definitions. We avoid them if at all possible. We try not to explain things. So if you've had somebody say to you, oh, it's a mystery, that's kind of the joke, right, for the Orthodox, it's a mystery, but it's true. It's true. So the Catholic and the Protestant mind feels compelled to define and explain everything. And that comes from that idea of the superiority of human reasoning. We should be able to explain everything, to reason out everything, even the existence of God. And if we try hard enough, and if we examine something hard enough, we'll be able to explain it. So orthodoxy, of course, doesn't function that way because the early church didn't. The early church didn't put out statements of faith. It didn't put out definitions of things. We did make a definition, or well, not really a definition, a statement. It's called the Nicene Creed. And in Greek, it's called to symbolon tispisteos, the symbol of the faith. That's kind of strange. Why would it be called the symbol of the faith? I can't remember. Sometimes in some service books, it's called symbol in English, but usually it's not translated as symbol. But that's what it is. Why is the creed the symbol of the faith? Because, believe it or not, the creed does not really define the faith. The creed is not a definition. The creed, because God cannot be defined. So the creed is sort of like the outer limits of what we can say. It's a boundary. It's a limitation about what we can say about God. And beyond that, we try not to say anything. So that's what orthodoxy is. We avoid definitions. We avoid statements. Whereas the Catholic Church defines everything. The Protestant various groups of Protestants, they also uh, publish statements and confessions and creeds and, you know, they explain who they are and what they believe and et cetera, et cetera. So this is something which, again, is foreign to orthodoxy. We only define something in reaction to heresy. So the church never felt the need to create deficient definitions and documents. That's why we have almost none. So people will ask me sometimes, what is the official Orthodox teaching about this? And they'll say, we don't have any. And they can't explain, they understand it. What is the official Orthodox interpretation of this verse? We don't have one. So now, if somebody interprets it in a way that's very contrary to the Orthodox tradition, we would all recognize that. But we don't feel the need to give a definitive, official definition, explanation, interpretation. We don't need to, we've never needed to do that. We know it's orthodox and when something's not orthodox. And we usually know it intuitively. Like I did as a student, something isn't right here. What they're saying is kind of right, but there's something that's a little off. And I wasn't a theologian, I was a kid. But somehow I knew that it was not quite right because of the way they were explaining something or how they, or what conclusion that they arrived at. So, another characteristic of Orthodox phronema. Emphasis on the holiness of the mind, not theological reasoning to know God. So, in many Christian circles, when you're talking about theology, they love the mental gymnastics. They love the argumentation. They love the logic and the complicated, sophisticated arguments that are made. And a lot of people, especially the armchair theologians, love that sort of thing. We do not do that. So you know what the fathers of the church, they called that to philosophize according to the Athenians. 
And they said that those were like spider's webs, very intricate but very flimsy. So St. Gregory, who was brilliant, St. Gregory the theologian, said that he preferred the philosophy of the fishermen. So even though the fathers of the church were highly educated, brilliant minds, they did not resort to this kind of mental gymnastics to explain the faith. They simply relied on apostolic tradition. They were able, with their brilliant minds and their incredible vocabulary, to explain many things and clarify things, but they did not get involved in these complex discussions, which you'll see in somebody like Thomas Aquinas, where they're asking a question and there's a, a deep analysis that's based entirely on human reasoning, deductive reasoning. So for the West, everything has to make sense according to human reasoning. Everything has to be supported by a system of beliefs that can be comprehended and logically supported by deductive reasoning. But we don't do that because we don't use deductive reasoning. And why don't we? Because we received everything that we need to know. We already received it at Pentecost. So the church has not um, elaborated on its teachings, and it has also not developed more teachings because it was the consistent teaching of the early church that the church received the fullness of the faith at Pentecost. And this is something which, again, is not recognized in Western Christianity at all. Now, why do we say that the church received the fullness of the faith at Pentecost? Everything that the church needed to know, it received at the moment of Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit came. Because when Jesus was telling them, the disciples, that the Holy Spirit is going to come, he said, I will send you the Spirit who proceeds from the Father, and he will guide you to all things. He will teach you all things, okay? He will reveal all things. He'll help you remember. He said a lot of things that the Spirit would do, but he would guide you to all truth. So that word in the future, that the Holy Spirit will do this, that word is the form of Greek which says that this will happen one time, okay? Not he will be guiding you, the spirit of truth will guide, the spirit will guide you to all truth one time, not continually, okay? The spirit of truth is going to guide you to believe this and then later more of this and then this and then this and then this. One time. So that's why it has been the consistent teaching of the Orthodox Church from the beginning that the Holy Spirit brought the fullness of the faith at Pentecost. We don't have part of the faith. We don't have part of the revelation. We have the entirety of the revelation. And that's based on that grammar, that Greek grammar. Because in English, too, we can say that. Um, I will go to Rochester. I will be going to Rochester. That's a continuous future, right? I will go to Rochester. That happens once, okay? I will go to Rochester one time. I will be going means I'm going to go periodically. So that's the difference between the future of one moment in Greek and the continuous future. And Greek has that distinction. Jesus didn't suggest that the Holy Spirit would continually be bringing new concepts. But that has become sort of the method of uh, oper the modus operandi in Western Christianity. So Protestants tend to say, well, the Holy Spirit has illumined me and he's lightened me to, to know this or to believe this or to say this. So every single person, they believe, can have this kind of insight. And of course, Catholics believe that they say that they don't believe in progressive revelation, but they kind of do. They know that that's not a good thing. So they say, well, it's not that it didn't exist in the early church. It's just that it was just in its infancy. So here's how they see the fathers. The fathers who are so important to us are not that important to Catholics, which is kind of interesting. Many, many Catholic schools do not, have a, do not have a single course in the Fathers of the Church. Why not? Because the Fathers were like an early stage of Christianity. They have a theory called the seed theory. 
and that what the church received were seeds of the truth. And it was up to the church to develop and grow the truth. And this was popularized especially by a cardinal called Cardinal Newman. And so it's very logical to them. This is how they explain the things that we say, hey, you guys, you added a lot of doctrines that didn't exist in the early church. They said, oh, the seeds of the doctrine were there. The apostles just didn't know it. The fathers didn't know that. They didn't know about it, but they kind of mindlessly understood it, and they would have expressed it if they could, but they didn't really know about it. So the seeds were there, and then over time, this came to be revealed to the church. That's a very strange notion for us. We don't need things to be revealed to the church. The church has all revelation. We as individuals don't understand everything. We need to enter into maybe a deeper understanding. But the church, the church knows everything and that it needs to know. The fullness of revelation was received by the church at Pentecost. So very, there was something very similar that happened. I, I was thinking about, um, I was listening to a Catholic radio program, and they were talking about... Um, they were talking about they want more doctrines for the Virgin Mary to be promulgated. At least one particular group does. So what they will do is they will start kind of a campaign to try to get the attention of the Pope to promulgate certain doctrines about the Virgin Mary. So as you know, among the things that they developed were doctrines about the Virgin Mary that were not part of the early church, but they are convinced that they were because they take like little snips of you know, the fathers, little statements from the fathers, and they try to use it to support this. For example, the Immaculate Conception of the Virgin Mary. And this, this is a doctrine of the Catholic Church that Mary was conceived by her parents without the taint of original sin, that there was something kind of miraculous about her conception. Not that they didn't have a normal, she didn't have a normal human conception, but somehow she was preserved, that's the exact language, preserved free from original sin. So this idea grew over time and eventually it was proclaimed a dogma in the 1870s, okay? Or is 18, 1850s, 1850s, I think. So this is the Immaculate Conception. Well, then because of this, they said, well, if she didn't have any sin at all, not even original sin, then she must not have died. So then they dogmatized the assumption, the bodily assumption of Mary, that her body was taken up to heaven and she never actually died. She fell asleep. Okay, so I had an, a discussion with a, a Catholic priest who was adamant about this, and he was a theologian. And I said, but Father, why do some? Because I didn't even know that there were many Catholics who believed that Mary didn't die. I said, Father, why would you say? Because it says she fell asleep. I said, but Father, that's what the Bible uses to refer to death. Jesus says Lazarus is sleeping, right? He means he's died. Paul says, we will not precede those who have fallen asleep when we have the funeral service. He's talking about the people who have died. That's the way the church speaks about death, that she fell asleep. He says, no, she really fell asleep. She didn't die. Why not? Because she had no sin. Well, gee whiz, Jesus had sins too, right? I mean, had, had no sins, but he died. So if you're going to make that argument about Mary, that she didn't die because she had no sins, then Jesus should also have not, have not died. Now, I'm sure they have some kind of a logical explanation for this. But it's this kind of progressive development of doctrine that characterizes the Catholic Church and it's completely natural to them because it's based on the reasoning, you see? If Mary had no sin, and why do they think she had no sin? Because she had to give birth to Jesus who couldn't be tainted by sin. Look at how sin is something like a taint on the soul. So somehow she had to be preserved from that. So they decide that she had no sin and then therefore, if she had no sin, she didn't really die. So this is the progression. So one of the things that um, some people who were promoting the Virgin Mary in the Catholic Church, they wanted John Paul II to declare her co-redeemer, declare the Virgin Mary, as a dogma of the Catholic Church, co-redemptrix. 
And then he decided not to because they knew that the Orthodox would get very upset about this. Uh, it was a good thing that he didn't. But this other, I started to tell you this story. This other, um, this program that I was listening to, they were saying we should pray and we should write, we should petition the Holy Father to proclaim Mary queen of the world. The, I don't really know the significance of why there was a queen of the world. And then because whenever, this is their thinking, this, this is exactly what they said, whenever the Virgin Mary, there's a new dogma about the Virgin Mary, then a lot of grace is poured out on the church. And we need to pray that God sends more grace to the church. So everybody should, have, should write to the Pope and ask him to proclaim Mary queen of the world or queen of the universe. So first of all, that person was right that when the bodily assumption of the Virgin Mary was proclaimed in the 1950s by the Pope, this was because he said he received many letters to the faithful, by the faithful. The Pope received many letters by the faithful urging him to make this a dogma. Wow, since when is there a popular campaign that tells the church what to proclaim as a dogma? But this is what he did. This is the reason he gives. So now they want to have another dogma, and that's because the church needs more grace. And this really blew my mind. The church doesn't need to pray to God for grace. The church, at least we would say, the church is the body of Christ. It has the fullness of grace. So look how different the mentality is there between from the one and the other. So we have a few minutes. I don't know if we should take a break at this point, and maybe I should just open it up to questions. Are there any questions or comments? Many of you come from diverse backgrounds. Is there anything that you would like to share or a question that you would like to make or to raise? Father has the microphone. It's nice if I don't do all the talking. I have been doing all the talking, and it gets boring for people. Now, since we uh, start, start off with one question, since we have, like my previous church was the Assumption of the Virgin Mary, which is what it's all a little bit about. Okay. Us, That's a good point. That's a really good point. Thanks, Father. The Assumption of the Virgin Mary, or we also had a parish called the Dormition of the Virgin Mary. In the Orthodox Church, we have not made that a dogma. We believe that the Virgin Mary was taken up bodily into heaven. Her holy body was taken up into heaven. We do believe she died, however. And if you have the assumption, we have the, you have the icon of the assumption. She's laid out there. It's, it's there in the back of the church, on the back wall of the church. And Jesus Christ is holding her soul. So she's died. The soul has separated from the body. So we never would say, ever say, that she hasn't died. But we do believe, because it's a tradition of the church, a very strong ancient tradition, that after uh, she was buried, they went to venerate her body, and it was gone, that she was taken up bodily. That's fine, but we haven't dogmatized that. We have not made that an essential teaching of the church. So the Orthodox Church tends to try to restrict dogma to that which is absolutely essential. And you can believe that or not believe it about the Virgin Mary because it's not essential to salvation. It is widely universally accepted by the Orthodox, but it has not been proclaimed a dogma by the Orthodox. Yes. I can't hear anything. If you ask a question, I'll repeat it. Okay. okay. Just go ahead. Hold up. No, oh, there you go. I'll just speak up. Um, so my question is about how our, our bishops and our hierarchs, I mean, they obviously discern things, right? And yes. And as does do our clergy. Yeah. And so... I know it differs, but can you help me explain how that differs from sort of how we discern, you know, what to do about 
communion or what to do about a new kind of medical treatment or yes, you know, yes, how yes. to help discern. I, like I said, I know it's different. I just want to understand. Yeah, that that's a good right. question. So the question was, how do, how do our hierarchs discern what to do when we're faced with a new situation? Like we had recently with a question with COVID and the spoons or you have with medical treatments. With some of the bioethical stuff, this is a very difficult subject area. And um, I think that there's still a lot of discussion in this area. But what, what they do is, of course, there's a lot of prayer, and they look to whatever seems comparable from the fathers of the church. And the hierarchs try to discuss these things amongst themselves and arrive at a common position of the church. But it isn't one person making the decision. So what happened in COVID for a while, there was a lot of controversy because at least one hierarch wanted to use multiple spoons for communion. The rest of the hierarchs in the Orthodox Church, I mean, almost none of them did, as far as I know. But there was a question about it. So, and it was a valid question. It hadn't been something that had been faced, you know, um, certainly any time recently. So Bartholomew, the ecumenical patriarch, sent out a letter to the heads of the other churches, the autocephalous churches, Patriarchate of Moscow, of Serbia, the Church of Greece, the Church of Cyprus, and there's, there's like a dozen or so of them, and asked them for their opinion. Now, ordinarily, they would have met together, but because of COVID restrictions, they weren't meeting. So he asked them to render their opinion what they think should be done, and then he received their opinions, and then he issued a sort of a statement on behalf of all of them. So we do things synodally or collegially, that is, our hierarchs try not to make decisions by themselves. Now, in an individual diocese or metropolis like this, Bishop uh, Metropolitan Nicholas, he's responsible for this metropolis. So, of course, he's going to do things that he thinks are right, that he thinks are best for his metropolis. And he has a lot of leeway to do that. But at the same time, if he were to step way out of line, he would be removed by the other bishops. So that is a very important sort of check and balance for the hierarchs. So I think, I think that they struggle sometimes to know what's the right thing. They, I think that our hierarchs are sincere and hardworking. They really want to do the right thing. But uh, discernment is a gift, and it comes with the Holy Spirit. So we hope that when they are ordained, they also receive that. But they don't always agree, so not everybody has it. Or, but I do think that they try to do their best. And then we as the faithful try to follow as best we can, um, respecting that that's their role. You know, I hope that answers your question. Good. Anybody else have a comment or question? Nothing? Yes, go ahead. Don't be shy. I, I'm just interested in the origins of patristic studies, and I, I know John Wesley was a big fan of yeah. the church fathers, and and I, I've heard that uh, Protestants would use the church fathers to undermine scholastic teaching, like Aquinas and people like that, as, as a way to sort of counter you know, the Catholic Church. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm wondering if, 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 in terms of your own studies, if that's something you've come across or... or I haven't, okay, the question is how, what, the, what about the origins of patristic studies and patristic teachings? Well, the, the fathers always were the fathers who came before them. So long before the reformers, the patristic studies was to read the fathers who came before. So when I'm reading Chrysostom, sometimes I'll recognize, oh, that's something Origen said. I know he read Origen. Everybody read Origen. And Origen had read Hippolytus and, and, and Irenaeus and the fathers who came before them. So for us, it's simply being part of that long chain, which is continuous. You're right about the reformers that they read the fathers too. Calvin read the fathers, he read Chrysostom, but they discarded the things they didn't agree with. So yes, they pulled out things that they liked to use as a weapon against the Catholic Church, but they ignored all those other things that the fathers said, but the fathers never spoke about sola scriptura, right? So, so they're using it in a very 
um, limited way, the same way that they use the Bible. They remove the particular saying or teaching of that father out of its context and use it as a proof of their position. We don't do that. And this is what's happening with the Protestants who are interested in the fathers today. They take out just specific parts and they're using it to prove their opinion. We read the fathers to learn how to think like the fathers. We want to conform our minds to them because they conform themselves to Christ. You see? Rather than saying, this is my opinion, and I'm going to find something in the fathers that supports that. You see what I mean? That's not, that's not honest. Your, the seminarians that you teach, are they trying to reclaim the fathers? Are the Catholic seminarians trying yeah. to reclaim the fathers? No. No. Uh, not at all, because they think of the fathers as, they wouldn't say they're not important, they're, but they really aren't important for them, because they believe that the church developed in its understanding. That's why I was talking about development of doctrine. So the apostles received seeds, and the fathers developed that a little bit, and then Thomas Aquinas was e even better, and mo they spent a lot of time on modern theology, but definitely they would see that the farther along the church progresses in time, the closer it is to the truth. That's what they believe. And they've kept changing because they believe that there are new insights that were brought, for example, during the Middle Ages. So if Aquinas is farther along than Chrysostom, why read Chrysostom? Why read Gregory the theologian? Because they have been surpassed, you see? And that's really, so they don't spend any time with the fathers. They don't have the mind of the fathers. So there, there's, a, that's why I said, in some Vatican documents, you will see them quoting very brief statements by the fathers because the Vatican knows that they have to show their, that they're in line with the early church and the patristic tradition, but they don't really rely on the fathers. They don't read the fathers the way we do. So there are people who are devoted to the fathers, and they like them, and they read them, but it's nothing like us. Yeah. Thank Good you. Good question. About uh, modern, uh, 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 about the, the fathers, patristic fathers, uh, how would we understand uh, uh, moderns like Ziziulis, Romanides, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yanaris, do we call them theologians mm -hmm. or do we not, as the Orthodox use that term yeah. to describe those who you know, are moderns? Yeah, that's a good question. So the question is, who are the fathers today? Do we have any fathers from today? Well, um, we, the Orthodox believe that there are fathers in every generation, but time will tell, this is my opinion. So um, that, that we don't know who, we don't call any modern person a father today, but we do have fathers from the early part of the last century. We, you know, um, uh, St. John of Kronstadt and um, uh, Nicodemus of the Holy Mountain and some from the 1800s. So we do have modern fathers, but whoever is today or, or more recent person, whether it's a Mayendorf or Schmemann or the Ziziolis or whatever, they will have to be dead for a while, and then eventually people will start to refer to them, and if, if they are recognized as having a holy life and, these, and that their writings reflect the true, true orthodoxy, people might start to refer to them in that way. So there's no, again, there's no committee that decides this is a father, this is not a father. It's what the church recognizes in that person, so it's going to take time in the orthodox sense be referred to as a theologian today as a theologian yes oh they could as a yeah because the theologian is one who talks about god so yeah that term and there are some people who want to show how you know intelligent they are they said the church has only had three theologians right uh john the theologian gregory the theologian and saint simeon the church has only had three so that's ridiculous the church has had thousands of theologians. There's nothing wrong with that word. But we've never given the title the theologian uh, except to those three. But it's ridiculous to say that the church has no theologians. Of course we have theologians, okay? We have people who have studied, and they speak about God, and they write about God. They're a theologian. But um, so this is like when I say when we say um, when you come forward with a chalice, Father, 
and you say, holy things for the holy, you're saying, come forward, you saints, right? So all of us who come to the chalice are claiming to be ayi, right? But we're not given the title until we die, and the church recognizes us as that. You see what I'm saying? So we're on a different level as the, the, those saints. And so the theologians of today are on a different level as the people who have been given that as an official title by the church. When you ask the question, make sure that you have the mic close to you because we're actually sure. recording this so others can see it, plus we have some people online. That's so just why I'm repeating it, just in case they're not heard. I was a student at St. Vladimir's Seminary when Father Schmemann died, mm -hmm. who was so much loved. Wow. And um, uh, Father, Father, um, let me see. Father what? When Father um, Schmemann? Schmemann died. And a, someone walked into the room and saw a student painting an icon mm. of him and uh, scolded her severely, saying you can't do that because you have to wait for okay. some time until it's forgotten in the mind of the church the sins that he committed, that he wasn't perfect, which I thought. Yes, so you, you were a student of Schmemann, and after he died, somebody was painting something in an iconographic style of, as though they were making an icon of Father Schmemann. And that, right. that person was scolded for that. Yes, that was appropriate because we as individuals don't decide who's a saint and then make an icon of them. We're supposed to allow time to pass, and the church recognizes this person as a body. So that was, that was exactly right. Thanks for sharing that. Well, well part of the point was that, he, that it wasn't the assumption that he had no sin. Um, right. And they want, they wanted to, he wanted him to be clear about that. Yes, of course. The, it's not that, because even the saints had sins. So it's not that. Uh, it's because the decision about who is a saint and who is not a saint is something that belongs to the church as a whole. That, that is discerned. The question before was about discernment. This happens in time, over the course of time by the church. So if, here again, sometimes people are very critical of St. Augustine. Well, St. Augustine has been canonized by the church. There are a lot of people who don't like Augustine, and they think that he shouldn't be a saint or he shouldn't be a father. Well, that's nice if that, that's your opinion, but that's not an orthodox thing to do. I think Augustine is not a father, therefore he's not a father. I refuse to recognize him. You, you're, you're so adamant in your orthodoxy, you're talking just like a Protestant, okay? Because we don't say, we don't substitute our opinion for that of the church. We don't say, well, I don't think Augustine should be a saint or a father, therefore I'm not going to recognize him. That's a very Protestant thing to do. But in time, it's possible that the church, now that we're more aware of some of the mistakes that St. Augustine made, it could be that future generations will stop calling him a father, and he will just be an early church writer. I think that's possible, but it's not up to me to decide. It's something that will happen organically in the church over time. That's how we function. That's why everything takes a long time in orthodoxy. It takes hundreds of years. We're very slow because the wisdom of the church is revealed gradually over time. Who has the microphone? Go ahead. <laughs> yes, thank you for the... Can you hear me? Yes, I can uh, hear you. Thank I will you repeat for that last question, comment because, because the Holy Fathers were human beings. Yes. And sometimes they would be mistaken, but the beauty of the church is that organically it removes the mistakes because specifically of what you said, that the Holy Spirit came down and, and it keeps the church holy throughout centuries. So that was, that was very so helpful. She, she said the Holy Spirit is what keeps the church holy. And it's the, the whole point is that it is the totality of all the fathers that keep the church on the right course. So Correct. yes, a father may have said this or that that might be a little bit off or a little bit different from how we might say it, but the church is not dependent upon one father upon one bishop, okay, upon one idea. It's the totality. It's the fullness of the faith. Right. Yes, thank you very and much. I just wanted to make a comment. It helps me to think of, of the West and the East in terms of how, they, how theology develops uh, to think back to Aristotle and Plato. And, and it was Aristotle that had 
more effect on the West, and therefore you keep referring to the to the left side of the brain and the logical, and mm -hmm. and there was like a basis to that kind of thinking that underlies underlies Western theological thought, whereas Plato was very instrumental in the Eastern understanding yeah. of things, and and it was not that. Not that Christianity is a philosophy in the in orthodoxy, but there was a basis of that kind of thinking about the mystery and about about the, the heart, the spiritual, the and, spiritual, and the aspect. right side of the brain for experiencing things directly, and and it's still very very apparent. So it's just yes. something I wanted to add. Th thank thank you. you for adding that. Yes, the West was highly influenced by Aristotle. They rediscovered the Greek uh, philosophers and were very impressed by them. But even before that happened, the seeds for this emphasis on human reasoning had been firmly implanted in the West. But then when they got Aristotle in the mix, yeah, absolutely. Yes, go ahead, Tatiana. Hello, Dr. Jeannie. Hi, Tatiana. She's visiting. Just speak close, Hello, put your everyone. mouth close to the microphone. Put your mouth close to the microphone. Like this? Yeah, that's better. Um, Myself and my friends, we are coming from St. Uh, Nicholas Orthodox Church from Jamestown, New York. And it's such a treat to have you here, Dr. Ginny. Thank you. And the discussion has been so interesting so far. I have two questions. I'm going to kind of move it away from what That's we fine. just talked. That's fine. That's fine. So regarding fasting, um, can you explain to us, Dr. Ginny, um, how... Um, it's help, helpful for us to control our okay. stomach okay. Uh, during fasting okay, in such fine. a way that we can uh, feel closer to God. Okay. And mostly, what are the fathers and the mothers of the church say about that, if, if you can tell us about that? So about fasting, how it brings us closer to God, and what do the fathers say about that? Yeah, like controlling okay. our stomach, how that helps yes. us. Yes, okay, okay. And my second All right. question. Okay. Um, so now that it's fasting and um, I'm paying more attention of what I eat and things like that, and also on the other side we have the word in Europe, mm -hmm. it's hard for me not to think how blessed I am that I can still have food. Sure. When I read about all these people who might be starving yes. without water, basic necessities, yes. how can I use that information to um, make my faith stronger during the Lent as opposed to starting to judge or like be upset at God or mm. think nothing very well? toward God, so to speak. Okay, all right. Well, those are really good questions. And Tatiana, you're, you're going to be around for the next session, right? You're not leaving yet, are you? Okay. So I'm not going to answer those right now because we've reached an hour and I want to let everybody stand up. And the next part of the section, this next session was going to be about living the life in Christ. And those were natural subjects that were going to come up, okay? So let's get up, stand up, take a, a break for about 10 minutes, walk around, and come back at 2.45, okay? Then we'll go to 3.45-ish. Father, do you, uh, do you do Vespers here? Hmm? You uh, do, uh, you do nah, Vespers just here. Okay, all right. Just checking. So we don't have to conclude by a certain time, but I think we're going to wrap up with it. We'll have another hour. I don't think I'll go, go much more than that, and then we'll ask, let people ask their questions. Okay. Like people get yeah. tired, by the way. Well, here, yeah, I think I'll do that. Okay, so Okay, great. If we could uh, we could have everybody go ahead and take your take your seat. 
Um, and we'll continue on for another yes. hour, I think you said, right? Yeah, we'll see. An hour and a little bit more maybe, and then right. we'll have open it to questions. And just have, have a nice kind of relaxed discussion. All right. Okay, I think that that's good. Thank All you, right. Father. Thanks. Okay, so we talked about Fronima, what it is, what it is not, how it creates unity. It reflects the unity. So how do we live as Orthodox Christians? Let's be practical about this. Um, I'm going, again, to acquire an Orthodox Fronima, that is to have the mind of the early church. How did they have their mind? How did they, ha how did they know what to believe? How did they know how to behave? Well, they learned this from the apostles. And this is very obvious throughout the New Testament. So we see this in the words of St. Paul. So there's a place um, in the New Testament, in, the, in 1 Corinthians, for example. At the end of the first epistle to the Corinthians, he addresses the fact that some of them were questioning the resurrection. So think about this. They were so intelligent, so smart. They knew better. And they said, well, we don't know about the resurrection. Maybe Jesus rose, but we're not going to rise. So St. Paul addresses this. And this is what he says. He says that this is the first thing I taught you. Now, there's a couple of places there. Where to the Corinthians, he reminds them of what he orally taught them. I handed on to you what I received from the Lord, that the night in which he was betrayed, the Lord Jesus Christ took bread with his hands and broke it and distributed it and gave it. He says this, that he already taught them that orally. So sometimes what we have from Paul is a reminder of what they already know, that he had taught to them orally. By the way, we haven't really talked about why books were not, you know, so important, why it is silly for people to insist upon um, everything being in writing, but I'm going to get off track if I start talking about that. So now to the Corinthians, at the end of this epistle, St. Paul says that he taught them about the resurrection of Christ as of first importance, that is, nothing was more important than that. And he makes a list, he says, and this is what I taught you, that the Lord Jesus Christ died. He, he was crucified and he was buried according to the scriptures. He was crucified according to the scriptures. He was buried. He was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. And he was seen by Cephas and James and the 12 and the 500. So he lists all these people that saw the risen Lord. Now that's not the complete list, but it is a list of the people who saw the Lord. And then he says, and so we taught, we, and so you believed. So he talks about how the apostles give the same teaching consistently. That's very important. We didn't have Philip teaching one thing about Jesus and Thomas teaching something else and Paul teaching something else based on their individual opinions. There was a consistency of the faith. This is extremely important. And today, people are trying to undermine this. So at the University of San Diego, I was teaching the course called Early Christianity. And then one semester in the listing, it was changed to Early Christianities, plural. I said, this is, I was the only person who was teaching the course. I've taught it for 20 years. And nobody asked me about that, but I'm an adjunct, so I, I don't count, okay? So they obviously had a meeting, and they decided to call it early Christianities because that's the trend today. The trend is to say that there was not just one form of Christianity. There were many forms of Christianity. I said, yes, but there was one church, and the rest was heresy, okay? But you're not allowed to say that. You're not allowed to use the term orthodoxy and heresy, Okay, that's politically incorrect. We just have to recognize that there were lots of different forms of Christianity. And I said, no, there weren't. There was the orthodoxy and heresy. So this idea that people have that the, that the, the in other words, just think of how they just presume that there were lots of different opinions about Jesus. Well, Maybe out there, but in the church, there was one understanding, one orthodoxy, and this is what, as an apostle, that is what you taught. 
So it doesn't really matter to me what a heretic might have said about Jesus Christ. The, the apostles were consistent in what they said. They were consistent. And St. Paul reflects that. So we taught and so you believe. This is what we, all, we taught you. We all taught the same thing. And elsewhere he talks about how all the apostles teach the same thing. Okay? So they were consistent because they were not giving their own ideas, their own interpretations, their own teachings. They were not giving the traditions of men, but traditions of the Lord. And most of what the Lord said and did was not preserved in the New Testament. So the apostles learned from the Lord. They lived with him for three years and they watched him interact with those scribes and the Pharisees and with poor people, with tax collectors and sinners and the chief priests. They watched his interaction. They watched him in the miracles. They listened to his conversations. He taught them. And they absorbed the Lord's phronima. They absorbed this. They learned a way of life. In, in Greek, we almost never use the word Christianity. I, I've, I don't hear people ever talking about Christianity in Greece. Christianismos. It's kind of weird. We, we refer to the church. What Christ left was the church, not a religion called Christianity. And the first believers didn't call themselves Christians. They never heard the word before because this was not a set of beliefs. It was a way of life. And the first Christians called their movement the way. It was a way of life. And they didn't care if it was logical, if it could be explained or defined. They didn't substitute what the Lord taught them for something else with their ideas. And when the apostles went out to preach and spread the gospel, where did they get that from? Whatever it is that they conveyed, from the Lord. They didn't have a Bible. They didn't have Bible studies. They taught the people what the Lord had taught them. Okay? So the apostles received from Christ what to believe about Christ and how to behave. And that is what the apostles gave to the first Christians. What the Lord taught them. And all of this was done orally. Okay? That's how the first Christians knew what to believe, I said, and how to behave not from writings, and that was very typical. So here again, if you encounter someone who says, where is the earliest written proof of icons, saints, uh, the esteem for the Virgin Mary, whatever it is, Eucharist, sacraments, where is the first written proof? Well, guess what? People did not write things down. So again, to f insist that the Orthodox Church meets some kind of artificial standard because that, those are the expectations in the 21st century shows complete ignorance of what the early church was like. How can you even have a conversation with somebody like that? You can't explain anything to them if they're insisting on written proof. The church did not write things down for many reasons. First of all, writing was not considered trustworthy. What? Today we say, show it to me in writing, but not then. What was considered trustworthy was the testimony of the apostles. People did not rely on writing the way we do today, okay? So if you learned something from an apostle, you trusted that. I know this because that's what Thomas told me. I know this because this is what Mary Magdalene told me, okay? So to expect or to demand written proof of early Christians' beliefs and practices is completely anachronistic. It's applying our mentality and our circumstances back, retrojecting it back to the early church. It isn't just that people couldn't read. They didn't trust writing. And the church was sacred. The teachings were sacred. You weren't taught these things until you were baptized. The services of the church were not witnessed by anyone who wasn't part of the community. You had to be baptized and chrismated and part of the community, and then you learned the mysteries of the faith. So we have lost completely this sense of mystery of the faith, and instead we share it everywhere. We talk about our faith to all kinds of people who, who don't deserve to hear about it, to tell you the truth. Okay, there are all kinds of discussions and debates on the internet for people of, with really profane minds. 
These things are sacred mysteries. So even Saint Basil talks about this. He talks about how the most profound mysteries of the church were not written down. And he's writing at a time when the Christian faith was legal. He's in the middle of the fourth century. So even um, the, the creed was not known. It was not heard by people who hadn't been baptized. Chrysostom wants to tell something. He's, he has a, he's giving a sermon, and he wants to say something about resurrection, and he wants to make a point by quoting a line from the creed, but he's preaching right after the gospel. So he can't quote the line from the creed because that's a mystery. And in the congregation are many catechumen and others, even people who aren't catechumens. So he has to sort of hint at the line he's referring to in the creed. Because people never heard the creed. They never even heard the Lord's prayer until they were baptized. Okay? So this idea that somehow everything should be preserved in writing if it ever happened or was practiced in the early church is totally ridiculous. And anybody who says that has no comprehension of what life was like in the early centuries of the church. So the authority of the church came not from the scriptures, but from the church, and the scriptures belong to the church, and this is how the early church functioned. They received everything from the apostles, and they preserved it as a sacred treasure. So how do we acquire this orthodox phrenema we've been talking about? There are many things we could say, but I'm going to boil it down to four points that we need to remember. First, we must make an effort. We have to make consistent efforts over a long period of time. We have to think about the fact that we are influenced by the world. I, I wrote the book. I'm not, you know, the end all, the last word on this, but I have to think about how I'm influenced by the world and watch my thinking. So we have to think about this because um, we can't be passive. We can't just kind of go drifting through life and somehow think that we're going to end up in the kingdom of heaven. We have to work for our salvation. Many Orthodox know that verse, work out your salvation, because salvation is difficult. It's not an easy thing. Holiness is difficult because we have to deny ourselves. We have to live a life of this denial of the self. We have to live a life of, of love and holiness requires prayer, requires devotion to God, etc. So how do we do this? We have to make efforts and we have to even consider the little things because there are many things, little things that we do. And these little things like bringing Koliva today to the church for the memorial Saturday. So this is a very important thing. I was thinking about all the names Father read this morning after, for the memorial service uh, of Saturday of the Souls. And he must have read names for solid 15 minutes. I thought, wow, all those people are gone. I hope someday somebody makes Goliva for me. So you younger people, please put my name on the list. I'm hoping that I'll be on somebody's list and somebody will pray for me because the day will come when nobody knows who I am. Okay, so my son will remember me. I've told him that before. Maybe a grandchild if I ever see one. But after that, I don't even know the names of my great-grandparents, okay? So I can't put them on the list. I wish I did. I can sort of guess what they probably are. But look at that practice of taking the koliva and making it with a, a love and intention and all those little kernels of wheat representing all those souls of everybody who came before us and bringing it here to the church and offering prayers for the, those people. What does that do to your fronima? What does that do to your soul? So I think it's very important that we consider these things and we make the effort to do those things because these kinds of behaviors, I might say, oh, that's okay, um, that's nice. Uh, nice what you say, Dr. Jeannie, but that's not really anything serious. But you know what? This sort of thing gradually transforms us drip by drip by drip. This kind of thing has an impact on us, okay? So we have to make an effort, and yet we have to recognize that we need the grace of God. So that's number two. We must engage in spiritual warfare. So it's more than just making efforts. We have to try hard, 
And we have to recognize that there's going to be opposition. So we need our ammunition. Fasting is one of the things we talked about. Um, sacraments, everything, the power of the Holy Spirit, our prayer, because we don't take on this challenge by ourselves, but only by the grace of Christ. And, and last night, uh, there was, we had the service of the Akathist, or Salutations of the Virgin Mary. And Father was reading the gospel reading. And Christ said, I am the vine and you are the branches. And my father is the vine dresser. And, you know, the, every branch that does not bear fruit will be cast, cut off and thrown away. And he says, apart from me, you can do nothing. So we recognize that we need Christ as we continue in this struggle. And that we're going to have setbacks. And we're going to have bumps along the road. But we have to keep fighting, and we cannot opt out. There is no pause button. This is a continual battle, and it's constant warfare, and it's mortal combat to the end, to the death, okay? Because the stakes are really high. And so for those people who think, well, it's not that important if we don't go to church because my kids are in sports, you know, they're really choosing eternal death. It's a stark thing that I'm saying here. I'm not saying, that I don't, I'm not saying they're going to hell because I don't know what's going to happen to them. Maybe the light bulb will come on. But to choose anything else above Christ, especially something so trivial, uh, before Christ. Even Christ said we, should, we can't even have our children and our parents and our spouses before him. Well, why, how would we possibly think that we could put sports before Christ or a job before Christ or anything else? We have to recognize that these are the forces of the world on us, and they're convincing us that this is okay. So we're going to be attacked. We're in spiritual warfare, and we have to fight because it is our soul and our eternal future that is at stake. The media is telling us, don't worry about it. You're a good person, right? That's okay. Why are you worried about this? You're a good person. Where does Jesus say that it's a good people who will go to heaven. You have to be a good person. Where is that anywhere? Okay, we have to become holy. We can't become holy when we're not engaged in the life of the church. So we have to transform the way we think, and then we have to decide, who are we going to believe? Are we going to believe the culture that tells us, it's okay, you don't have to go to church, or are we going to believe the church? So it's a very dangerous thing to say, I, I know better than the church. Oh, the church is just, well, you know, they just need the money, or they just want to see a lot of people in church, or whatever, whatever they have, whatever excuse people have. But definitely people are choosing their own path. And that path, that's a very dangerous thing. So we have to realize that there is a battle out there, that the devil is fighting hard against us. And don't succumb to the illusion that there is no spiritual warfare. There's plenty of warfare going on. Okay, and people are saying, ah, oh, that doesn't really matter. There's no such thing as hell. That's also very popular today. And the devil's very happy if we don't think there is a hell or that hell is not eternal. Of course he's happy because then we relax, we don't struggle, and we don't fight the good fight. And then before you know it, we have lost everything. So we need Christ. And then number three, we need illumination by the Holy Spirit. So we have to struggle, we have to turn to Christ, we have to recognize that this is spiritual warfare, and three, we need the illumination of the Holy Spirit. So how does this begin? We were set on that path. When we were baptized, we received what is called holy illumination. Okay, holy illumination. And through holy illumination, we received the Holy Spirit, and then we are chrismated. And we are given all the gifts of the Spirit to live a Christian life. But that's not the end of it. That's just the beginning. So we should never be comfortable with the fact that we're baptized and we're Orthodox Christians. So we need to become illuminated in our mind. We should learn about our faith, absolutely. But we need to become purified in our mind. We have to be thinking um, about how we can become more holy in the way we conceptualize things. We have to read the lives of the saints and these kinds of things and gain knowledge of God, not so much through intellectual exercises, but through 
the, the reformation and the renewal of our mind. So the Orthodox Church has always emphasized spiritual experience of God as the way to know God, not so much studying about God or human knowledge or teachings. So you can know a lot. You can know the Bible. And this is something that really throws a lot of Orthodox. They meet somebody who quotes the Bible up and down and backwards, you know, and they seem to know a lot. And the Orthodox can be very intimidated by that or very impressed by that. Just because you quote the Bible doesn't mean you understand it correctly. That means nothing, to tell you the truth, because there are Orthodox people who can't even read. They might know some Bible stories, but they know Christ. So just because you can cite facts, you can rattle off the canons of the church or quote a lot of Bible passages, that does not prove anything because we don't approach God through our intellect. We approach through, through, through knowledge. We approach God through spiritual experience, and that comes from participation of the Holy Spirit. So the prayer, the life of the church, the life directed by the Holy Spirit. So how do we do this? Number four, we immerse ourselves in the life of the church, Christ and the church. This is a liturgical life. It's a sacramental life, but also at home. When we are at home, what have we created in the home that supports, that conveys even wordlessly how we're supposed to live our life? So at the lunch, somebody was saying, well, what do we do about teenagers who don't want to come to church? Well, it's, it's good to say, listen, you're coming to church because as long as you are part of this household, you, should, you will come to church. And you, know, you don't want to have a fight with a teenager over it, but there are ways to we could say, inspire them to come to church, okay? Because they owe that to you out of respect for you because it's your house. Now, I don't think people should be forced to come to church, but at the same time, we're trying to impress upon them why it is important. And you can sit down and have a conversation with them, not you go to church because we go to church, but explain why it is important because Teenagers especially really want to know what's in it for me. What, di what difference does it make in my life? And I think if we can answer that question, then we can go a long way toward encouraging them to have a relationship with Christ. Then we can go a long way toward encouraging them to come to church. Okay, so how about some practical advice? I'm going to list nine things in terms of how we create this Orthodox Phronima, what do we do? I said, immerse yourself in the life of the church. I'm going to give you nine things to think about. And this, this is all in the book, so I don't know if it's worth it for you to write it, but these are, I have, I have even more in the book. First of all, attend church services and follow along. I think this is so important. It's not enough to just stand in church, pick up the service book, read the prayers. Read them in your mind, follow Join the choir if you like to sing because this is where we learn the hymns of the church and these words, hearing them and reading them and saying them over and over and over and over, they shape our mind. It's a crime that we know and we remember commercial jingles from the 1960s or 70s or 80s and we hardly know a psalm. Okay, we know a lot of popular songs and we can't recite the prayers of the church. Learn them, say them at least in the church, and these things really shape our mind. Say your prayers every day. Number two, say your prayers, create a ritual, have a routine. This is very important that we have a routine. Um, and then you're going to have to find what works for you. This is not one size fits all. What works for you? For me, you, well, it was the time when, there was a time when I would say my prayers when I got to the office because I had to work very hard just to get out of the house and get to church, get to, get to school. I got to my office and the first thing I did was say my prayers. That's a weird place to have your prayers, but it was a place I knew I wasn't going to be disturbed. I wasn't going to be interrupted and I wasn't stressed because I had arrived, you know, so this is what I was doing. Um, I have found recently that I'm not going to the office as much, and we weren't going at all because of COVID. And my father lives with us. He's 98, 
So this is a big challenge for me. If I don't get up early before everybody else, it's very hard for me to say my prayers. I'll end up saying them, but not very well, okay? Because as soon as my father is up, I have to tend to him. And then I'm distracted. Then Father Costa gets up and he wants his coffee and then they want their breakfast and then the, the pills, da, 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 da. And now my day is off. I'm off and running. So you're going to have to find what works for you. But make sure that you try to create a ritual, a routine. And then not only in the morning and the evening prayers, of course, cross yourself often. We kind of gotten out of the habit sometimes of doing that. Make a blessing over what you do. Cross yourself when you get inside your car before you start to drive. Bless your, your food on your plate. This is, if not, don't, do, don't follow the priest's blessing. Hold your fingers in the orthodox way with three fingers and make the sign of the cross over your food before you eat, not to mention saying the prayer. Bless yourself bless, throughout the day. In other words, these are ways that we sanctify our daily lives. These kind of mundane activities of daily life can really have a lot of power in terms of orienting us toward God if we begin to do these things. So we might have to remind ourselves initially, but after a while they become a habit, okay? What else? Number three, participate in the sacraments, not just communion, of course, but confession, <clears throat> holy unction, the sacraments are there, holy water, come to the service, receive holy water, take it home, drink from it appropriately at the right time, bless your house, have the priest come and bless your house, do all of these things. These things are sanctifying and we don't really think of them that way, but these things contain great spiritual power. And the one thing I really want to talk about is confession. There is absolutely nothing other than communion. Nothing is more important than confession. And there may be some of you out there who have never been to confession or who haven't been for a long time. And you're making up all kinds of excuses of why you shouldn't go why you don't need to go, you really haven't committed it. You haven't killed anybody, that's the usual thing. I haven't killed anybody, therefore I don't have to go to confession. That's not the standard, okay? You should go to confession on a regular basis. And you absolutely must, this has tremendous benefits, besides the forgiveness of sins. I understand that people are embarrassed, they feel like the priest is going to not think very highly of them, because they're going to tell them all the, the bad things that they did. But the priests, let me tell you, there's two things. First of all, the priests have heard everything. They're not shocked by anything, number one. Number two, they're not judging you. They're there to forgive you, to convey to you the forgiveness of Christ. They're not there to judge you. And number three, the priests hear so many confessions, they don't really remember everything. I think that if you had killed somebody, that they would remember. But all these other things, the usual stuff that goes on in our lives, they can't remember all that stuff, who did what. And the other thing that people say is, the priest is going to talk about me. I'm like, they don't. They do not do that. They're very, very sensitive about that. They don't convey other people's confessions. If they do, they can be defrocked. I don't know if you know that. That's a very serious violation that confidentiality that the priests have. But confession is more than just forgiveness of sins. It's a way to get another person's feedback or perspective on your life. So you go there and you say, this is what I'm struggling with, Father. These are the things. Prepare yourself. Make a list so you're prepared. Don't omit anything ever. Even if it's hard to say, say it. R write it down, say it, blurt it out, get it over with. And say it, and then you will see that you feel better. So rather than drowning out your sorrows and finding other ways to, to handle whatever stress, go to confession, you'll find that it relieves stress and you get the perspective of another person, especially a person who's experienced in guiding other people. This is, this is another thing. The other reason why confession is very useful, is remember, this is medicine. So it's as though you have wounds, you're covered in wounds, and you've gone to the doctor, but you say, don't look at my wounds, okay? What's your symptoms? I don't have any symptoms. I'm fine, I'm fine, I'm fine. Well, you're dying, but you're saying, I'm fine, I'm fine, I'm fine. 
So when we reveal our wounds that we have inflicted ourselves, the priest heals them through the prayers, through his advice, through the grace of Christ and the Holy Spirit. When we expose our wounds, we have prevented or, or healed ourselves from the attacks of the devil. And we also can prevent future sins because we have received guidance from the priest. Or sometimes it's because we say, you know what? I'm not going to do that. I kind of want to do that, but I don't want to do that because I'd have to confess it. So I'm not going to do that. It actually serves as a deterrent. So the priest sometimes can see the direction our life is taking. Sometimes we have a fantastic idea. Father, I have a great idea. I really think that this is what God is calling me to do. And he says, well, wait a minute. As good as that sounds, that's probably not a good idea. And he can prevent you from making a lot of mistakes. So if you have not been to confession for a long time or you've never been, you have to begin. And it's very foolish of you not to go to confession. And this idea, well, I'll just confess to the icons. Rubbish. Absolute nonsense. That's not what Jesus said. Confess to the icons. He gave the authority to forgive sins to the 11 in the upper room. He gave that to the church. That's a blessing to you. That's a sanctification for you. That is your ticket to heaven. And you don't want to take it because you're proud. That's what it is. It's about pride, and pride is the worst sin. And if we remain proud, we can't hope to be saved. So that's why we have to get over that. And once you start coming regularly to confession, you'll find it's not so bad, okay? You might find that you're making mental notes to yourself of what to confess next time, okay? Because you're preparing yourself. But it's so important for our introspection, for our sanctification, for spiritual guidance. I can't say enough about it. So... What else? Number four, read the scriptures. This is practical advice for how to have an orthodox prima. Read the scriptures and other spiritual writings like the lives of the saints. There are a lot of ways to do this. If you don't have a lot of time, I don't have a lot of time. You can listen to the scriptures. You can be standing in line. You all, all have a smartphone. There's an app, the Greek Orthodox app, Archdiocese app called Daily Readings. If you, you know, download that, it has the epistle and the gospel reading of every day and, while, and also the saints of the day. And while you're standing there killing time waiting for your appointment or something, you can do the, read the epistle and the gospel of the day. Ancient Faith Radio has a podcast called The Path. It's fantastic. It has the epistle and gospel readings of the day followed by patristic comments explaining it for you. It takes about 12 minutes, 15 minutes at the most. I listen to it on the way to work. Otherwise, I don't have time. So this is something which is very, very important, that we read spiritual things. Okay. Number five, cultivate virtue, do good works. Those things also shape us. Now, they don't help us by, because we, as a checklist, remember, well, let's see, I need to give money to the poor, so I'm going to just give money to the poor. Check off my list. One more thing. Okay, no, it's not about that. It's that we remember the poor, we pray for the poor, we sacrifice for the poor, and hopefully we give generously, even sacrificing things that we might like ourselves, and instead you say, you know what, I don't really need this. I'm going to take that money and give it to the poor, and do it. Give it to the church. Give it. You have philoptikos here, like every parish has philoptikos. You know, they do a lot of important work, if you're not sure who to give to, you have Philoptuchos. They have 100% of their donations. They go, they go out to very good causes. You have I, IOCC, and you have Inter, International Orthodox Christian Charities. We have Focus North America. There are a lot of Orthodox organizations that do very good work, Orthodox Christian missions. So make a decision. These are the, the, um, the charities that we want to support. Definitely generously support Philoptikos and everything that, that they do. And this is very, very important because we have to show mercy. We have to show mercy to others if we want God to have mercy on us. And then that's one virtue. Give alms, almsgiving. What about prayers? What about practicing patience? What about, what about um, practicing forgiveness? What about 
practicing humility. What about not cutting in front of somebody in the line? You know, whatever. Little things like this. Why am I doing this? We're kind of on automatic pilot. So sometimes we do things kind of automatically. I know, I know I'm guilty of that. So I have to stop myself and say, why is it so important that I do this? Why do I have to get in front of this guy? <laughs> I'm just like that. I'm going to get in front. I'm kind of competitive by nature. So I have to stop, all right? Because that doesn't show a very good spirit. All right. Number six, make your home a little church, okay? Every home is a little church. You should have, I'm sure everybody does have, an icon corner or an icon wall. Have a candili that you light, uh, you know, and whatever suits you. It could be a candle, it could be the oil, it could be whatever. Follow that. Try to have it lit every evening. Try to remember when the sun goes down, say, glad some light, fossi ladon. Follow the rhythm of the life of the church at home. Um, I bought the series of the icons of the major feast days. So I created a little niche, and so we changed the icon. So we're now I'm going to go home, I'm going to take out the icon of the Annunciation, I'm going to put it there. So it's a reminder to us of the rhythm of the church, of the feasts and the fasts of the church. And as you're establishing your little house church, make sure you find and establish an appropriate lifestyle, something that's appropriate to your role, and your seasons of, season of life and your circumstances. Don't, so when I say appropriate, what do I mean by that? Don't pretend to be a monk. Okay, if you're not a monk, don't act like a monk. If you're not a nun, don't act like a nun. Don't think that you need to dress like a nun. You don't need to eat like a nun. You don't sleep like a nun on the floor. There, what happens with the Orthodox is we get very enthusiastic. We read the lives of the saints. We read the spiritual writings and of the church, and most of those are by monastics, and they're for monastics. So we get all enthusiastic and think, this is how I'm supposed to live. Or people read the canons. My husband had a spiritual father. Um, my husband had a spiritual son who read the canons of the church that said, during Lent, you're supposed to eat bread and water. And that's what he wanted to do for Lent. Okay, he say, because that's what he read in the canons. Well, that's not how the canons are applied. We don't read the writings that are for monks and by monks and then think that we can live like that in the world. And that's why you go to confession. You say, Father, this is what I would like to do for Lent. What do you think? Bread and water. And he's going to say, absolutely not. That is not smart. Or he might say, why don't we start with this? And then next year you could try this. And after a couple of years you can try this. But he knows what's best for you. You don't make those decisions. So we have to be very careful that we not try to do things that are beyond our ability, as though we're living a different kind of life. The monks don't live like us, and we're not supposed to live like the monastics. But also things change depending upon the season of life. Sometimes we have young children, and it's all we can do to get five minutes to ourselves, ten minutes to take a shower. Um, and then, so your life, your sacrifice is there. there you don't, you're not supposed to somehow live some kind of monastic life too. Don't, don't picture this, I, don't, don't, don't delude yourself with this idea that somehow your life is supposed to be something different. This is what you have right now. You're married, you have children, you have a lot of obligations, a lot of responsibilities, and your sacrifice and your prayer is through that. And we should recognize that. So we have to find a role and something that suits our lifestyle, our season of life, our circumstances, whether we're working or not, whether we're monastics or lay people, whether we have young children or elderly parents or whatever it is. That's not to say we're making excuses for why we can't do more, but let's be careful not to try to overextend ourselves to do things that really don't suit our our life at this moment. And the reason is because then we end up failing, okay? And then we get become discouraged and we say, oh, what's the use? I can't do it. Or what happens is the devil gets this, puts an idea in our head. This is what you should be doing because that's what you read in that book, right? Right. 
And then you know what happens? This creates strain and stresses in the house. And then the devil's very happy because now you're arguing during lunch. Okay? So we have to recognize that sometimes the good that we want to do can be used by the evil one against us. So we have to, again, that's why, another reason why we go to confession, because the priest will help us to recognize that this thing that we think is wonderful is actually going to harm our family. Okay? And it happens that way because sometimes somebody becomes very enthusiastic and they want to do something that the other spouse does not want to do, or you impose something on your family that your children really are not prepared for, you're expecting too much from them, or maybe not enough from them. So these are things that we have to balance and we need a certain amount of discernment. So number seven, practice fasting. Why should we fast? And maybe I'll take the time to answer Tatiana's question about that. Why do we fast? I hope I have both of the questions, parts of the question. I know I saved it. We don't fast because we get points to get into heaven. And we're certainly not supposed to fast so that other people can see us fast. We fast to learn self-denial. We train ourselves to be obedient to God, not to follow our own desires. So remember that one of the things of, <laughs> one of the things the fathers say a lot is that the first commandment was fasting. So the fathers like to say this. In other words, Adam and Eve were told, don't eat the fruit from this one tree, and they broke it, and this led to sin, right? The fathers, many times the fathers say they, they broke this sin. Of the, they should have fasted from this fruit, but they didn't, et cetera. So this is the connection between fasting and sin. In other words, we learn not to follow our self-will, but to deny ourselves. So I'm laughing at that because Father Costa said this once. He would always give a sermon the day before Lent started, on Forgiveness Sunday, and encourage the congregation to fast. And, you know, I would hear him say this thing, and I was kind of smiling. So the, one of the times that he said that, he said, the first commandment is to, no, he says, we have to follow the first commandment during Lent. So we got in the car to drive home. I controlled myself. And then, as once we got in the car, I start laughing, okay? And that's because Actually, the very first commandment in the Bible is be fruitful and multiply. I said, I said honey, that's not the first commandment to fast. Because that's the to not eat the fruit, that's in chapter 2 of Genesis. But be fruitful and multiply, that's in chapter 1 of Genesis. Okay? So I just, I just thought that that was funny. I just couldn't. I, I just had to say something. After hearing him say this so many years, I said, you know, I just, I just couldn't take it anymore. So... What does fasting accomplish us? How does it bring us closer to God? Because when we're hungry, like Presbyterian Terry and I were talking about this the other night, even when we're eating and we feel kind of full because we've eaten vegetables or even something really nice like shrimp, we're still hungry. So that hunger is, should remind us about God. So fasting is really a tool to help us bring our minds closer to God, Okay. So that's what the fathers say about it. It's about self-denial because we have to be able to um, deny our self-will. That is really the cause of sin. Sin is that we follow our self-will. We all have it. So, you know, you see this if you're a parent and you raise a child, they get to be about one year old. Before that, they don't really have a self-will. They're just existing. You feed them, they cry, you know, you clean them up. They're just there. At about the age of one, they start to really um, sort of exert themselves, and a lot of the personality comes out. So I remember saying something to Christopher. He was about one year old, and there was something on the table, like on the coffee table, and I said, don't touch that. And so he knows he's not supposed to touch it, and he does this. He's looking at me to see. Okay, that, I said, wow, that's the self-will coming out. Okay, so that was the original sin. The sin was that they didn't care what God said. They followed what they wanted. And self-will is a form of idolatry. 
I do what I want. I don't care what you want, God. I'm going to do what I want. Okay? So fasting is a way of self-disciplining so that we learn not to always follow our desires. Self-control, that's, that's what it is. That's pretty uh, basic. Now, in terms of the, the question that you made about war and being mad at God and things like this, fasting, when we see the, the tremendous need that exists today, especially in the Ukraine, this is something else that was done by the early church, and many Christians practice fasting for that reason. They eat less so that they can give more money to the poor. And if you want to eat less or say like, because a lot of people will say, well, you know, lobster is fasting food, you know, king crab is fasting food. <laughs> kind of, yeah, it is. But wouldn't it be nice to say, yes, I could afford to have king crab, which is, what is it, like $35 a pound or something like that at Costco. And you could buy the king crab or you could say, you know what? But there are people who are really suffering in Ukraine. So rather than buying two pounds of king crab, I'm going to send $70 to IOCC. Then we can do that. Then it's really a direct decision. And instead, I'm going to have lentils tonight. Okay? That's a beautiful thing. And God honors that. You know? But we do, do this prayerfully. And then we say a prayer for those people. So how can we not lose faith when things like that happen? I don't know why we'd be mad at God. What does God have to do with it? Why would we be mad at God? I, I don't know. God, bad things happen. Yes, they do, because there is sin in the world. There will always be sin in the world. And what we have to also recognize is there's also good in the world. So we have to have that balance. We can't allow the devil to malign God. That's what happened in the garden also. The devil said to the woman, isn't that terrible of God? He told you you can't eat any of this wonderful fruit in the garden. What did God say in chapter 2? He said you can eat all of the fruit except this one tree. Now in chapter 3, the serpent says to the woman, oh God, he's so terrible. He doesn't let you eat any of the fruit. And she corrects him right away. She says, oh no, he could say we can have all the fruit. We just can't have this one, right? So the fact is that the devil is a slanderer and a liar, and he slandered God from the beginning. He's slandering God today. So anybody who says this is God's fault, this war, or anything else that, bad, that happens, that is the devil, okay, speaking to destroy our faith. And we say what? Get thee behind me, Satan. Make the sign of the cross and say, get thee behind me, Satan. No evil comes from God. We are the source of the evil in the world. So this is just, this should be something that we think about and that we pray like Father did today in the Divine Liturgy for Ukraine. We're going to be praying a lot for them. We'll do what we can, but ultimately, you know, that we're limited to what we can do, but certainly not, we're not going to say that God has anything to do with this. Um, number eight, learn your Orthodox faith, but also remember and accept that we cannot understand and explain everything. And I also mentioned, I think nine was about confession. I had another one. So let's talk about, as we wrap up, avoiding certain pitfalls. As we are trying to acquire an Orthodox phronema, what should we avoid? Are there things that we should not do? What should we watch out for? Well, first of all, avoid extremism, avoid legalism, avoid rigidity. This leads to pride, and there are a lot of groups, especially internet groups and many of the schismatic groups that are extremely legalistic, extremely rigid, and very proud, okay? So this is, many converts are vulnerable to this um, because many converts are seeking a sense of control. They want to know, what am I supposed to do? So they take those guidelines and they make them like rules and they want to define and delineate everything and then they apply the rules, and then they want to make sure that everybody else is living by the rules, okay? So that is to take kind of the Protestant mindset and color it with an Orthodox uh, paint, okay? So we don't have rules that we follow. Christ doesn't demand anything. He invites us. The church does not demand anything. The church does not obligate us to do anything. Believe it or not, we would say, well, that's a rule of the church. That, that's a law of the church. We really shouldn't talk with that kind of language. The church invites us to participate. 
The church doesn't demand anything. Christ, because Christ doesn't demand. Christ says, if you want to follow after me, pick up your cross and follow me. But he doesn't say, you better follow or else. He doesn't say that. He doesn't demand that we submit to him. That's Islam. I submit. You must. You're compelled. You're obligated. That's also the language of the Catholic Church. This is an obligation. You're obligated to go to Mass on these times, and for these days, you're obligated to at least. We never speak in the language of obligation because it's up to you. It's your free will. It's your free choice. You're invited. So this is very, very important that we... That's why the spirit of legalism is a distortion of orthodoxy, okay? A lot of people think that the fathers must have been very, very strict. But actually, the fathers charted a middle course. You're not more orthodox because you're more strict in your fasting. You're not more orthodox because your priest has a beard and a cassock and wears that everywhere he goes, okay? You're not more orthodox because you have a beard, or because you wear a long skirt, or you cover your head in church. These are externals we have to be very careful about because it leads to a kind of legalism and then a kind of spiritual pride, which is deadly. So we can say, well, or we could think, well, I'm a better Orthodox because I'm fasting more strictly than everybody else. First of all, you don't know about that person, what their life is like, and what requirements they have. You're not in a position to judge, but you're not supposed to think that you're better than others to begin with. Orthodoxy actually is devoid of a spirit of legalism. Orthodoxy is not about rules. If you think that that's what the Orthodox Church is, a set of rules that you have to follow, you don't understand it at all. Those are guidelines. Those are medicines for healing of the soul. Orthodoxy is not rigid. It's not conservative. It's not unyielding, but there are many people who think that by maintaining certain standards, we've got to do this and we have to do this, and that's really what makes us orthodox. The calendar, the beards, the cassock, the head coverings, uh, the strict, 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 whatever, fasting regardless. You know, the, you can't even put a drop of oil in the water to, when you're boiling the pasta, this kind of thing. Um, this is not orthodoxy. That's a real distortion of orthodoxy. Orthodoxy is actually kind of relaxed. And this is very difficult for people to understand. So I want you to be careful. I'm not saying that those things don't matter. But they're not a test of true orthodoxy. And orthodoxy recognizes that there, there, are, there are reasons why sometimes things need to be relaxed. So we're not supposed to be rigid about these things. So I'll tell you something that happened. It was kind of funny. <laughs> I was pregnant with Christopher. So I had, a, I had been pregnant before. And um, that was a very dangerous pregnancy. I almost died. And I was in the hospital for two weeks. And I was very weak after that. So then when I was expecting Christopher, who's a whole story in himself, he's a kind of a miracle child, when I was expecting Christopher, the doctor was very worried about me and wanted to be sure that I had very good nutrition and that I, you know, ate meat and this kind of a thing. I'll have a wide variety. But it was Lent. I was, he was born in May, so I was pregnant with him during Lent. So I was eating meat during Lent during this pregnancy with Christopher. It was the only, he's the only child I've had. So um, this priest came to visit us. He and his wife were our brand new um, uh, assistant priest. And before they found a place of their own to live, they came and they stayed in our house. And um, I really needed to eat meat, so I didn't want to scandalize them. So I waited till they went to sleep, and then I barbecued a couple of lamb chops outside on the barbecue. <laughs> so the next morning... Then, and there's, there are a lot of things that they did to me to make sure I didn't lose Christopher. Okay, that was, we, eating meat was one of them, but I, that's okay. I lost a lot of, uh, there's a big, big story. I lost a lot of blood. Women know these stories. Women talk about these stories. Men hate these kinds of stories. Pregnancy stories. But it was, it was a very serious complication the first, one, the first time. So the next morning, our new assistant priest comes down the stairs and says, I could swear I smelled lamb. <laughs> <laughs> because 
their bedroom window was under was above where the barbecue was. I don't know if even if even if the window was closed, I think they would have smelled it. I could swear I smelled, oh my gosh, I must be losing my mind, you know. I could swear I smelled lamb. And I started laughing. I had to tell him it wasn't losing his mind. That was me. But that's an example. There are people who have to eat before coming to church on Sunday, okay, because they take medication. There are people who are just becoming Orthodox, and they're not really ready to fast strictly. So what do we say? You have to keep this fast, and you can't eat this, and you can't eat that, and you can't eat that. Well, we, that's not for us to say. We're not the fasting police. We're so, you're supposed to look at yourself. What are you doing this Lent? How are you disciplining yourself? Don't mind what the other people are doing. That's not your job. Let the priest handle that, okay? So orthodoxy is not about keeping rules. We don't benefit from following rules. We're supposed to conform ourselves to the way of the life of the church, but not in a sense of, not, a, not in a rigid way, not in a legalistic way. So we're supposed to have a middle course, not compromise. We don't say fasting is nothing, it doesn't matter, but also not legalistic. You have to do this, you know. It's a sin if you don't do this. Be careful. So being more scrupulous doesn't make you more orthodox. This is why the church gives us the story of the publican and the Pharisee. We have to take that seriously. Okay, because the Pharisee says, you know, I fast twice a week. Thank God I'm not like this guy. We could say, well, I go to this kind of a church, and I keep all the, the fasts and all the feasts of the church. I'm always in the church. I, I know the Psalms by heart. And, I, and, and yet, if we're far from God, if we're boasting about that, or if we think for even a moment that because we do these things, we're better than someone else, we have lost everything. And all those things have zero spiritual benefit. Can you understand that? You can do a thousand prostrations. But if by doing them, you think that you're better than somebody else, they benefit you not at all. And that goes with fasting and everything else we do. So that's where the fronima comes in. These things are an expression of our faith and actually can help shape our faith. But as soon as you get that thought, and you will, wow, aren't you wonderful? Look at you. You're fasting. Bravo. That's coming from the devil. That's from the devil. And he's trying to use your fasting against you. Use the good things that you do to bring you down. So we have to be very, very careful. So don't get sucked into this idea that we have to keep rules and that somebody by do, somehow by doing them we're a better person because of it. We could become a worse person because of it. Number two, avoid false piety and false humility. Oh my gosh. I hate to say this, there are a lot of Orthodox that do this. There's a kind of false piety, false humility. They want to be pious, but it kind of becomes like a show. I'm going to dress like this, and I've actually heard Orthodox say, well, you know what, you should always look down, because that's a sign of humility. So when this priest is talking to you, do this, look down. Now, if you're normally humble and you're, you're kind of shy, some people are, they don't want to look somebody in the eye, they look down, or you're listening, and you want to show, or, or this, if it's a natural reaction, that's one thing. But to do it because it's a sign of, that means it's a false display. How can that possibly be a good thing? Okay, that's hypocrisy. So we have to be very, very careful, okay, not to pretend to be something that we are not, not to act like a monk, dress like a nun, behave in a way because we're trying to portray something portray ourselves as something other than what we are. This is a very dangerous thing. Um, I, I mentioned this before, number three, follow a lifestyle that's appropriate for your stage of life. Don't try to act like a monastic and don't make the monastery your parish. So you must have some near, monasteries nearby. There are people who want the monastery to be their parish. That's not what a monastery is for. You're supposed to have a parish. You go there on Sundays, visit the monastery, of course, support the monastery, but that's your, not your parish. Your children need a parish. You need a whole life. You need to have all these meetings and these fundraisers and these other things that you do that's part of the life in the community. It's one of the ways that we work out our salvation when we see this person that we've butted heads with, but we, 
we make friends with again. You know, we forgive them. It's, it's in this parish life that we achieve our salvation because this, this is where we're meeting these challenges of the world. So if you're just going to the monastery and praying, you're not really being challenged. And it's not necessarily the best thing for your soul. You see what I mean? So I don't know if you have that issue here, but, but we do in some places in the West. So the other thing that happens is if we try to make... Uh, do something that's not really appropriate for our life. We try to think that we're just going to go to the monastery and this is the best thing for us. Sometimes uh, we neglect our family obligations. There are people who assume that because they've discovered orthodoxy, they uh, are called to the priesthood. We've seen a lot of that. I've seen, I've seen people on the orthodox say, I want to be an orthodox priest. How do I do that? And they haven't even become orthodox yet. What are you thinking? You know, how is that possible? You're not even, a, you don't even belong to a parish. How can you be thinking this? But sometimes people become very enthusiastic with the faith. So what does the devil do with that? He creates conflict between the husband and the wife. Resentment between the children, um, from the children because they feel neglected by their parent who is always at the church. You know, there can be too much even of church. Okay, that's true. We've had people who were always at church. In our very first parish, there was a lady who was always at church. And the, the proestamos, my husband was the assistant, the proestamos would say, Barbara, go home. Okay, this is not always good. We have to recognize that there has to be balance in life. Again, not a compromise, but balance. So it's not, it's not a virtue to be neglecting your family. Now, we talked about putting Christ first. That's different, okay? We're talking about believing in Christ, going to church. This is a different thing than just working at the church and being involved in different projects. Number four, avoid self-righteousness and hypocrisy. We kind of talked about that. Orthodoxy is not conservative, or, but tr don't be traditionalist. Don't act out of a sense of obligation but conform to the church. Again, we talked about Cain and Abel. Rathi Mia. The Orthodox Church invites us to participate. There's a difference between obligation and obedience. Yes, we are obedient. We talk a lot about obedience. Obedience means that we have made the choice to follow the direction of this priest or of the church. We are obedient to the church, but the church does not demand anything from us. The church does not obligate us, does not compel us. We choose to conform ourselves to the church, not out of obligation, but because we know that this is where we will find our sanctification. Some of these I've already mentioned. Number six, don't think of your spiritual life as a checklist to be accomplished, but the goal of our life is union with God, sanctification. Don't be judgmental. Number seven, that's very difficult sometimes for us. And don't compare yourselves to others. Because sometimes we have that tendency. You know, I, I know I have. I have to stop myself. Okay? Sometimes we know a little bit. We know, think that we know better than the priest. Or sometimes we think, why is this person doing this? They should really know better. Why are they crossing their legs in church? Why are they not fasting from this or doing this? So this is very, very deadly. If you're a convert, you're probably judging the cradle orthodox. If you're a cradle orthodox, you might be judging the converts. Okay, because mind your own business, okay? Don't do that. Okay, the converts don't understand the cradle orthodox, especially in Greece. Greece, they're very relaxed about everything. That doesn't mean they don't have a fervent faith. One time I heard a lady say in church, I went to church, the Greek church, I think it was a Greek church, and they weren't even shouting Christos Anesti. And they never, they, they weren't reading the fathers. And I think, I thought to myself, I can't really picture my grandmother shouting in church, even Christos Anesti. I don't think they did that. I know they never read the fathers. But they had a faith that was deep and profound. So we tend to look at the externals, what we just see in the person, and then judge them. We can't do that. On the other hand, you have a convert who's so enthusiastic about the faith. This is wonderful. Don't throw cold water on them. Don't judge them and say, hey, we don't really need to do that, and you're, you're too religious. Don't, don't do that. So we have to 
stay in our lane, not judge others, and mind our own business. If you think that there's something really wrong with somebody, privately, tell it to the priest and let him handle it, okay? Number eight, don't give spiritual advice to others. I, that doesn't mean you shouldn't share your faith, talk about, especially to your children, your spouse, talk about the sermon, talk about the Bible reading, the stories of, but when you are receiving spiritual instruction from the priest, don't talk about what he told you. Never say to another person what you said in confession. Sometimes the, this, this gets out, okay? Even if you say it to your spouse, okay, what you said in confession. And then the person, uh, people hear about it, and then, and, then, and then what do you say? You say, oh, Father revealed my confession. No, Father didn't reveal it. You did. You see what I'm trying to say? Be very careful. You're never supposed to talk to anybody else about what you said in confession. And don't share your advice. Somebody asked me a question once, and I was at a conference like this, and I answered it, and they said, oh, so then we should do this, because I said, my spiritual father told me this. Oh, then we should do this. I said, no, no, that's his advice for me, not for you, because everybody is different, and the spiritual, our priests, our spiritual fathers know to tailor what to, things to um, your life to what works for your life, okay? Number nine, think about what's inhibiting your spiritual growth, keeping you from acquiring a fronima of the a church rather than the fronima of the world, and recognize that, that we are impacted by the images and the programming that we receive through the world, and not delude ourselves to think it has no impact, okay? Think about how you can become a more faithful Orthodox Christian. And lastly, be patient. It doesn't happen overnight, and guess what? You're never going to arrive, okay? You're never going to reach the place, hopefully, that you say, I've got it all figured out. I got this. I hope not, because then you'd be like the Pharisee, okay? So I have to tell you that for myself, um, I feel like I'm in first grade. <laughs> I do. Okay? So, I, so even though I wrote this book, um, I don't feel that I have all of the answers to everything. So at this point, maybe we can take a, a break. And if you want to stay and stick around for some questions, we could do this. But I just want to encourage you to fight the good fight. Just continue with your struggle. Don't measure yourself against other people, either to, to be proud of yourself or to knock yourself, to criticize yourself. Don't do that because we don't really know about others. That's why we're just supposed to focus on ourselves. With your family, with your spouse, with children, then you have an obligation to try to help guide them. But otherwise, don't uh, involve yourself with other, what other people are doing, but do your best and try to improve every year in the areas that you think you need improvement, okay? So I talked for a long time, I think more than an hour. I'm sorry about that. You're probably very tired. So let's take a break for a few minutes, stand up and stretch, and then we'll have a final session if you want to stick around. For some questions or comments, I'd love to hear from you because I don't like to do all the talking. Thank you, Father. Okay, everybody, stand up and move around. So let's um, get seated, and I think that Demosthenes is going to wave at me at some point. Yes, and we're beginning again, so it's been a long day. I, I thank you for your patience. You know, you don't have to sit so far back in the church. You can come a little bit closer, and Father's got the microphone. If you have any comments or questions, um, certainly open to them. I don't know everything, but I'll do my best. And just reactions is fine, too. If you don't necessarily have to have a question, I'd sure love to hear your reaction to some of these things. 
Okay. Can you hear me? Okay. Um, so, Dr. Constantino, I, I am a Catholic, and so sometimes when you say the Catholics think this or the Catholics believe this, I, I become uh, surprised because I don't believe that. Or okay. I, and, yes. um, for example, um, the Catholics have to explain everything. Well, we speak about mystery yes, all the time, do. the mysteries yes. of the rosary. Or the Catholics don't pay much attention to the church fathers. I'm going to, uh, I attend the cathedral downtown, mm -hmm. and all the time he's, we're okay. talking about the church fathers and sermons. And, and also there's a, tr a trend in the United States these days to yes. get back to the mystery, to get back yes. to a more orthodox Catholic uh, experience. I attended, I graduated from the University of San Diego, okay. and I had many friends who were seminarians, yes. and I have some kind of feeling of where you're coming from, because, for example, I stopped donating to the University of San Diego when I saw where it was going. I, mm. I mean, there's a lot, you say there's a lot of different kinds of Catholics, yeah. and I, I yeah. agree, that that is true, but I would see, I can see the trend of the church getting more back to the Orthodox and um, so, uh, one more thing. <laughs> also, you know, you say um, in the Greek church, we do everything the same way as we always have. Yes. Well, I mean, there's pews here, yes, there's an yes, organ yes. here, yes. and like you mentioned that the catechumens um, never right. even heard the Our Father before they were baptized, but now we, you baptize infants, just like we do in the Catholic church. So. I, I, by your own like thesis okay. that the Catholics are so fragmented, um, it's sort of confusing to me because I see in the Orthodox Church not like this single, single one thing, and also because people are involved there and there's sin in the world, mm -hmm. and so. It, it's like it's a very, very complicated thing. Yes. So I wanted yes. to bring that up. Thank you for bringing that up. And you bring up some very important points that I am trying to draw broad conclusions. Whenever you paint with a broad brush, Catholics think like this, they do this, we do that, you're going to have a lot of exceptions. You're absolutely right about that. I know that the Catholic Church does not believe in legalism. I know that they embrace mystery and recognize that there's mystery. So in comparison to Orthodox Christianity, it's quite different. There, it, there is a code of canon law. There's an official Orthodox, a Catholic catechism that's on the Vatican website. There is always this desire and training in seminaries to define and to explain. How does the communion change from bread and wine to the body and blood of Christ? That there's a definition for that in the Catholic Church. So when I say that they feel the need to define things, I'm not saying that they never say that they're, they, they don't believe in mystery or anything like that. Of course, absolutely they believe in mystery. And that the Orthodox have always done certain things. There are certain things that are different. We had infant baptism. I'm not suggesting that, that we never had infant. Of course we had infant baptism. That from the beginning, the church had infant baptism. So yes, there are some changes and some modifications for the culture. Among the Orthodox, there are differences, cultural differences, in terms of the expression. So here in America, we have pews. You don't see that in Greece. And even in America, many of the little Russian churches, they won't have pews for people to sit. They stand for the service. So I'm not suggesting that the Orthodox are in lockstep, absolutely uniform about everything, or that the Catholics have no sense of mystery or anything like that. And you are correct that there is a return to the fathers. And there has been a return back to thinking much more like the Orthodox in the Catholic Church. There's a big difference since Vatican II to today because of this. And they are trying to recover the idea of sin more as illness. And also going back to the fathers thinking more in terms of mystery. So really the Catholic Church is trying to recover many aspects of what has been more traditionally orthodox. But at the same time, there are the, the, the piety of the Catholic Church still reflects the old, really tridentine 
mentality of the church coming from the Middle Ages in a way that orthodoxy doesn't. That's a distinction I'm, I'm bringing out. So yes, there's a trend back to the fathers, but most Catholic, or actually I can't say most, many don't have a single, I've been at USD for 20 years, never had a single course on the fathers of the church. Not even St. Augustine, who's huge in the Catholic church. So even though there's some interest among Catholics, and it might be growing, it pales in comparison to what they represent in the Orthodox Church. And you still have this idea that they are somehow, they're, they're important because they're early. Even at the Franciscan School of Theology, there's no course in patristics. There's nothing like that. So I'm just making that in terms of the comparison one and another. I'm glad to see what's happening with the Catholic Church trending in many ways closer to us, but I have to tell you, I'm very concerned that there's also another group in the Catholic Church that's taking it farther to another extreme, right? Wherever they want women priests, they want gay marriage, and, the, the, and a lot of other things that are so contrary to the Catholic tradition. I personally find it very con disconcerting because the Catholic Church in this culture, uh, honest to goodness, I, I start off by saying, I've, I am a product of Catholic education. I went to high school. I went to USD. I got also a Catholic master's, a master's degree at USD. So I'm very grateful for, for what the Catholic Church has done in this, cult, in this country to provide an opportunity for Christian education. I send my son to Catholic schools too. But what's happening right now is that the Catholic Church is beginning to reflect more and more the world. They're having the same kind of problems that we're having, that we're compromising with the world. And um, it's a matter of concern, because I, I will tell you something that happened. It was pretty, I, I was rather disappointed uh, last year when Pope Francis came out with his statement that the Catholic Church cannot um, sanctify or legalize, or however he put it, uh, homosexual unions. Um, our department at the University of San Diego, Department of Religious Studies and Theology of Religious Studies, um, decided that they needed to make a statement about this. And so somebody, the department chair, made a flyer, and she passed it around to everybody in the department what do you think about this flyer? I think we need to have a Zoom meeting because we were under lockdown at the time and talk about this because our students will be very upset, all right? And so they made this flyer. We're going to have a Zoom meeting, a forum to talk about the Pope's uh, decision. And on the, that, that was fine, but on the flyer it said, we must oppose the Pope's homophobic attitude. <laughs> And I said, look, you know, and I was the only person who did this. No Catholic stepped up, and this is this dominant Catholic, you know, uh, faculty. I said, listen, this is just my opinion. I'm not Catholic. You can do what you want. But I think that if you're going to have a forum to talk about why the Pope is not accepting homosexual marriage in the Catholic Church, you should take out that part that slams the Pope and I'm here I am defending the Pope, okay? And you should start out the discussion by talking about what is the traditional Catholic teaching about marriage. And if you think the Pope is wrong, give us a reason why he's wrong and why after 2,000 years the Catholic Church has had this stance about homosexual unions and now it should be changed all of a sudden. At least present it that way. At least pretend to be unbiased. You know, that did not go over very well. Okay, and the, but I should not have had to do that. I shouldn't have had to tell the head of our department that I think it wasn't the appropriate tone to have, that we're going to criticize the Pope. But this is what's happening in the Catholic Church, and that can't be denied. So you, you know that because you mentioned it. You want to follow up on that? You want to say something? No, it's not just the University of San Diego. It is the university, I agree with, I understand what she's saying. So she's saying that, thank you, Father. She's saying that's the University of San Diego. Our university was not particularly um, liberal. It has become more so lately. 
And there are some extremely conservative Catholic institutions, but most of them are like that. We're behind the curve. We were the last to be, one of the last to become like that. University of San Francisco was like that, Santa Clara, Notre Dame, and other places. So at the one, on the one hand, they're talking about Catholic values and Catholic teachings. On the other hand, they're violating them because, and this has to do with the fronima. The idea is if you use human reasoning to arrive at theological truths, then if I can give a rational reason why we should allow homosexual marriage, it should be okay. This is because of the Catholic, this is a direct result of the Catholic fronima. And so it, we're, it's not just at the University of San Diego, but I'm sad to see it at my university. And to tell you the truth, I, I decided this is my last semester there because it's very t difficult for me to tolerate that. And, and the students who really appreciate what I do, I've had Catholic students who on their evaluation said, she's more Catholic than my Catholic professors. Well, that's a very sad commentary for a Catholic university. But that's what's happening in the Catholic Church today. It's not just at a few universities. It's widespread. And the problem is this. They are the ones who are teaching the students and the theologians. They're training the theologians and the priests of the future. So that's going to trickle down to the people eventually. It's, it's not just an ivory tower thing, unfortunately. Thank you. Um, I just uh, have something to say. This is uh, what your story, what you said. Remind me of an experience. So uh, last year during COVID, a friend course. of mine, a friend of mine who is Catholic, she invited me to her church, um, which I don't know what Catholic church is. It was a Catholic church. I don't know what's the difference or how traditional or whatever. They had a study, a eight-week study. And she said if I wanted to go to her eight-week study. Mm -hmm. So I went with her, and it was a very interesting group of people. And um, at the beginning, their priests were talking about the mystery and, you know, things like that that you brought up. And I was thinking, oh, this sounds like orthodox. But then, when he went more through his study into the faith, um, he did brought up purgatory, and he had some examples um, in the Bible about that, and uh, that, that didn't sound convincing to me. For me, I was like, okay, I don't really believe this. <laughs> and, um, but I didn't say anything because it's my friend and it's her faith, and I was there to listen and be supportive of her. Um, they did brought up the Immaculate Conception, which also didn't make sense for me. Um, but again, I don't say anything. Um, they, they also brought up uh, this idea that um, the fact that in Orthodox Church, priests are married, and they were against that. And Jesus wasn't married, the priest should not be married, which I didn't agree with, but I didn't say anything. Um, they did say that sin is an illness, but then they went back to the Catholic idea of, you know, you, you get punished, you break the law kind of thing, mm -hmm. like that. So it, it was a little confusing, but um, I support my friend. She does her rosary every day. Mm -hmm. uh, I encourage her to go to her church. I think it's good that she has that connection. And I, I pray for her and uh, all my other friends that are evangelist or Protestant or because there are not that many Orthodox in our area. But I just wanted to mention, I understand in one way your opinion that there, there was that kind of discussion but also, they are still doing their yes. own um, there, there's a, there's thing. Th thank you for that, thank Tatiana. You. I mean, definitely, look, there is, that's why I said there's lots of different varieties. There's lots of what you see in the Catholic Church. If you go to the Mass, you can see anything from a very traditional Mass 
to a very strange mass, very modern mass. So you have a tremendous variety of experience in the Catholic Church. It has a lot to do with the priest and sometimes has to do with the bishop of that area. Thanks. Any comments about Fronima? I would think uh, that uh, uh, part of an Orthodox Fronima is compassion. I would Absolutely. think that, that would be part. Uh, so because sometimes, and you even mentioned it, uh, that sometimes as Orthodox we can become overly pious and then overly prideful. That's right. So what, are, what is a suggestion for how to compassionately engage in a conversation with Catholics and Protestants so yeah. we don't come across as holier than thou. What's my suggestion? Well, I don't bring anything up unless they do. That's one thing. I don't try to tell other people how to live. I'm very proud of my Orthodox faith. I have a, a platform because I'm in the classroom, and the students all know that I'm Orthodox. Sometimes they ask me things about it, and I'll, I'll just, I just say things very matter-of-factly. Um, say um, about, if they ask me about our beliefs, mostly I'm talking about the Bible, so it doesn't come up that often. But um, I think we have to be respectful. And I, I'm telling you, I'm only highlighting some of the differences between us to explain the difference in the mind. But I, I don't have an argument with Catholics for what they believe about the Pope, for example. The Pope is very important to Catholics, and they need to keep him, OK? Because right now, he's the most important um, aspect of unity in the Catholic Church. But, and I don't have any problem with them saying this is the teaching of the church and that Peter was the first pope. I don't have any problem with any Catholic telling me what their, what their belief is. But they shouldn't say that this is how the church always was, that the early church recognized Peter as the first pope. Then it's, that, that's the, the only quarrel I have. But I think people are free to follow their own traditions. And they should, and I'm very respectful of other people's faith, and I think we have to be respectful. So if they ask me, I will answer. But Father, you're bringing out something very important again. We not to be in a triumphalist manner, not to be in a, a not that we. Again, when I say we have what we believe as Orthodox Christians is the fullness of the faith, because we are the closest to the early church. As a matter of fact, I've had Catholics tell me that they know that our worship service is not that we're a carbon copy of what happened in the early church, like they had pews, but that our worship services, our prayer life, our, our acts of piety, uh, you know, this, this is what the early church lived and did. I believe that firmly. If somebody asks me, I'll tell them. But that doesn't mean that they're nothing or that they won't be saved or that they, that they have nothing. We don't believe that either. And we're pretty... We're pretty open-minded about that as Orthodox Christians. We never say who's saved and who's not saved. So I just think we have to be respectful. And if asked, we should give an answer, but not say that, uh, not, not, not in a triumphalistic manner, unless you said, Father. Thank you. Yeah. Chris. Um, thank you, Dr. Jeannie. Uh, this is kind of a little bit off of topic, but I was a convert, mm -hmm. Protestant, very strict, uh, Bible-based church, yeah, yeah. and uh, I came to Orthodoxy after meeting my husband, who's been an Orthodox all his life, and the one thing that struck me when I first started attending church with Jim was the emphasis on the Theotokos, mm -hmm. and in yes. the church that I grew up in, yes. Oh, yeah. Mary, we didn't yeah, call yeah. her anything yeah. other than Mary, and it was at Christmas, and she was done. And when I started attending the Orthodox Church, amongst many other things that were different from how I was yes. raised, that stood out to me yes. as very significant and very yeah. sad that the importance of Mary and the Theotokos in the Orthodox Church and in the story of our faith was push to the side. Mm -hmm. Can you explain, based on, you know, what you know about yes. the other face, why? Why that was the case? Yeah, why is Mary not honored the way we do honor her so much in the Orthodox faith? Because, um, because the Protestant Reformation was a reaction against the Catholic Church. And the Catholic Church, there were many abuses 
and there was a tremendous power in the papacy. There was a lot of corruption in the papacy at the time, and the Catholics knew it, and a lot of the popes knew it, and a lot of the popes tried to, to change course, but they found it difficult to do. So when the Protestant Reformation happened, they reacted against everything that they perceived as Catholic, and that was one of them. Not all of them, because Luther was not as radical as his followers were. Luther remained very close in his teachings to the Catholic Church. But after his death, his followers of the Lutherans became a little bit even more kind of anti-Catholic. So there is a lot of anti-Catholicism even today in the world, you know. And um, Catholics bear a lot of brunt of, uh, of um, there's a lot of prejudice against Catholics still among, among and it's just ignorance. But they, don't, they didn't know about the early church, so they assumed that the early church didn't have saints or Mary or sacraments. They just decided for themselves what they thought the early church was, and of course what made sense to them according to their human reasoning, and they created these different kinds of churches. So it's just a reaction against Catholicism. And the, the Catholic church does emphasize Mary even more than we do. So there's a very high, I mean, a lot of Marian piety, a lot of Marian doctrines, Marian feasts that we don't have. So they reacted against that. Yeah, that's all. Because to the Protestant mind, if it's Catholic, it must be bad, must be wrong. And unfortunately, that's just ignorant. I've had, I have students, by the way, I have students who say, I used to be Catholic, but now I'm a Christian. Oh. I always say Catholics are Christians, but there are Christians who say Catholics are not Christian. Well, so I'm telling that there's, I have a, more than you might think, a lot of sympathy for Catholics because there's a lot of hostility against Catholicism that we as Orthodox haven't really faced. So they are, to, they are people are told, I had somebody say this to me once, he came to my house, and um, it was a repairman of something, he says, oh, well, yeah, but go, but go to this church and now, or you have these, so I explained to him about the icons that we had, and um, he said, yeah, but Catholics aren't Christians, he said. My pastor told us that. And I said, why do they say that? Because I wanted an explanation. Because, because they worship Mary. Of course, that's wrong, too. We know they don't worship Mary, but that's what they're told. So, okay, so how do you combat that? It's hard. Hi, Dr. Janie. Thank Hi. you for being here. Um, I grew up a Catholic. Um, I came from a Catholic, uh, devout Catholic family, and um, just last year found the Orthodox Church, and um, I was um, chrismated in September. So um, one thing that I still struggle with is the, um, the legalism, like, kind of like you stated, of the Catholic Church. Yes. Um, you know, I still feel the effects of that, and I yes. have a hard time. Yes. Um, and I know that that's something I'm going to be struggling with for a while. Um, especially purgatory was very scarring for yes. me. Um, I would do all the obligations, the indulgences, mm -hmm. and I just felt like it was just, you know, it was a struggle. And so... Um, do you have any suggestions for, you know, anything specific, yeah. maybe a church Boy. father, just someone who can just help me to break out of that, that legalism and like that checklist of yeah. you have Boy. to do this and this and this wow. um, to be united um, yeah. with our, our God? You know, I really still am struggling with that. I'd well, appreciate that, that's, that. That's, thank you for sharing that. So you came from a very strict Catholic family. And the legalism is something that you're still struggling with because, because there was that sense of obligation, and if you don't do this, you're going to go to hell, and you're the, that kind of a thing. Um, I can't tell, give you a father to read, and the reason is because that mentality did not exist in the time of the fathers, so they never wrote anything to combat it. You see what I mean? So most of the fathers are writings against heretics of their time, and, the, and like, you know, Marcion or Arius or paganism. So there's nothing to really combat the spirit of legalism because that didn't exist in the early church. So what you have to do is simply, you're going to have to work at it, and you're brand new, and this is just going to take time. And try to relax. Make the sign of the cross and, 
and just say, God loves me. Relax. Just allow yourself to breathe and say, I don't have to worry about that anymore. And the fact is, God accepts us where we are. And we're supposed to just continue to try to make progress little by little. I'm trying to do more this Lent than I did last Lent. You know, I am just not very good at a lot of things. So I just have, I just rest in the mercy of God. And that's a beautiful thing. You might have to remind yourself because it's very deeply ingrained in you. There's a friend of mine who keeps writing to me. He just went to confession. I don't remember if he was raised Catholic. I think he might have been. But he um, really suffers from a lot of anxiety and sense of guilt. It's overwhelming. And he kind of convinced himself that he shouldn't even go to confession. And I say, how can you come to that conclusion? He said, because... We're supposed to be prepared to receive communion, and I don't feel prepared to go to confession. I said, well, prepare yourself. He says, yeah, but I know that I keep confessing the same sins over and over and over and over, and so I feel like, what's the point of going? And I feel like I'm being insincere. So he just talks himself into these things that are in his head. So you're going to have to deprogram yourself by reminding yourself, and there might be certain phrases that resonate with you as you do your reading, something that strikes you, that really is meaningful to you, write it down, have a book. I would say, say those things over and over. Say the prayers that remind you about the love of God. And it's just going to take a long time before you exit that mentality. But it just say, this is not what Christ was all about. And he, you know, and just remind yourself and try to just except that it's going to take time, okay? But it will happen. The more you come to church, the more you pray the prayers of the church, the the faster it will happen. And try to pay attention to really listen to and read the words of the prayer and see how this is orienting you toward a different way of approaching Christ. He is philanthropos, the one who loves mankind. So when very often... In English, it's translated different ways. The lover of mankind, oh, loving master, but it's the word philanthropos. He loves us. So we have to remind ourselves of the love of Christ. And all the best with that. Anybody else? Over here, Father. Father's a little go-to today. It's our little... Thank you, Father. (laughs) Thank you, Dr. Jeannie, for being here. And this will be very quick. Um, I, although I was baptized as a baby in the Greek Orthodox Church in Greece, um, but didn't grow up at all with the faith. We, you know, there was incense in my home and icons around, but we would, you know, walk, when we would visit family in Greece, we would walk in a church, light a candle, and walk right out. Yeah, like, I yeah, never yeah. went to a service um, <laughs> until light, I was older. The light a candle. <laughs> I just want to light a candle. Yeah, yeah we made true. a sign. My mom, luckily, my mom me that much so I'm grateful for that but so I went through a period of you know I didn't really have faith I didn't know yeah. anything at all um, and so now that we have children in that teenage realm and preteen realm right. um, they they're always um, coming with us or you know they're 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 good sports let's just say you know they're not um, putting their heels in or anything but I think from my background I'm very afraid of like what will be, or that they won't have faith, or that they, yeah, they'll, they'll yeah. not come, or you know. Yeah. But it hasn't happened quite yet, so I don't want to like introduce the right, monster right. under the bed right, that right, they're not right. yet afraid of. You yeah. know what I mean? So, um, if you, I was just wondering if you had any suggestions, kind of preventative. I mean, still, I know you're going to say like, yeah. still pray at home in the little home, and you know, yeah. go to church and services. But how do I? like not be so afraid and put on them what they don't maybe or maybe will not experience or yeah I don't just any suggestions yeah I I think first of all as long you want to bring them to the church you want the home to reflect what you believe in the church you want to live the totality of an orthodox life and try to talk to them in a very casual manner around the dinner table why we believe what we do 
Why do we do the things that we do? So that they are informed, so that they know that's important too, that they have actual knowledge, so it doesn't seem to be just this thing that we do that has no real meaning. And when we don't know, we find out. Let's get some books. Let's find out about it. Let's listen to Ancient Faith Radio. Let's ask Father Angelo. And so that they become, they grow in their faith because what has happened is we have relegated in this country the faith to Sunday school. So they come for half an hour. By the time they take attendance and get in the room, sit down, have a lesson, it's not more than half an hour. And they're not going to learn to be Orthodox in half an hour, you know, half of the Sundays of the year. So that's why the Fronima is really instilled in the home. I would be less worried about it than you. I think you, I do think, however, that we do need to talk to them about what we believe. And I have to tell you, I, I, I was surprised to ask Christopher once, Chris, why are you an Orthodox Christian? And he said, that's the way I was raised. And I said, that is not a good answer. I can't believe that after all this, with you as a father, as a priest, that's your answer? That's how I was raised? Oh, my gosh. So, and he was grown by then, you know. So I really expected a, a stronger answer. But um, so, you know, we have a lot of opportunities with our kids to talk to them in a very casual, non-threatening way about the faith. And we should do that as often as possible. The more conversations that we have, the less it feels like a conversation about. Then it gets kind of heavy and that sort of thing. I don't think you can, I think what you're doing right now and by having these conversations is you're inoculating them against the world. They have to be prepared for when they go off, when they go to college, they're going to hear all kinds of nonsense. You do have to have those conversations. As they get older to the 16, 17-year-old, you know, does God exist? Why do we believe that God exists? What do we believe about the Christian faith? Because they're going to hear all kinds of garbage that's spewed in the, in the culture against their faith. And they might not stay in the church, but that doesn't mean that they won't come back if they have that foundation, especially if it's something that feeds the soul. Because um, we all, I never left the church, but I had a lot of doubts too, okay? And I think that most people do. And I have, I think I asked Chris about this once, but I do encourage parents and youth people to talk about doubt. I know you don't want to introduce that, but at some point it's going to happen whether they tell you or not because there are very few people who've never doubted, very few. Most do at about the age 16, 17, 18 years old. They're not sure if they believe in, that God even exists. I went through that. I was in that period for a long time. I'm talking about many years even I was a presbytera, and these doubts would come to my mind. Well, how can you really believe this? This seems kind of, and I'm a very rational person myself as a lawyer. I had to fight against this. And this is something that eventually it went away. I don't know how. But I don't think we should be afraid to ask our children if they have doubts. They should feel like they, they shouldn't be ashamed so that they know that they can always come back. And they should come to church even if they're struggling with doubt. Because what happens is, I remember uh, when I was a teenager, I would be praying, and then these thoughts would come to me, oh, God doesn't really exist. Now, that's coming from the devil, of course. Why are you praying? You're such a hypocrite. You should stop praying until you're sure that God exists, because otherwise you're a hypocrite. And this is what they're told. But that's not how we discover God. That's not how we come to know that God exists, by not praying. We power through it. We continue to come to church. And eventually, we arrive at that place where we know enough. It's hard for young people because they don't have the life experience. But eventually, they will probably come back even if they... But you, all you can do is your best. And then let God take care of the rest. And never, never give up. And always pray for them, of course. I'll, I'll tell you one other thing. I had an aunt who was a wonderful person. She was a registered nurse. She worked all over the world in very dangerous places as a nurse. And she got frightened by the preaching of an Orthodox priest, and she kind of left the church for a while. And this really distressed my mother a lot. And so my 
my aunt would go to when she was in the United States, because a lot of times she was overseas, she would go to whatever church was around, okay? Um, she would go to the Methodist church, the Presbyterian, whatever church was on the corner. She never stopped really believing, but she wasn't an Orthodox Christian anymore. This upset my mother. I'm sure my mother prayed for her for a long time. After my mother's death, she started coming to church, and she had some spiritual experiences. So she became a very devout Orthodox Christian. Now, my mother never lived to see that. But, you know, we don't know. We never know the effect that our prayers have. And just letting them, if they feel like, if they come to you and say, Mom and Dad, you know what? I don't know if I believe in God. Give them a hug. No scolding, no judgment. If they know that the church is a place that they can always come home to, where they're always loved and they're not judged, then they will know that the door is open and you never know what's going to happen in the future. But we have to leave some things to the Lord, their patron saint, their guardian angel. Sorry about that. I'm talking too long. Father, does wasn't anybody that, else uh, have a comment? Wasn't that uh, Kierkegaard? Let God be God? Let God, well, yeah, sure. Let God, let God handle it. And, you know, St. Monica, one of my favorite stories, because I have an aunt who's also struggling with another child who doesn't go to church. This is a different aunt. And um, so I started to talk to her about St. Monica because St. Augustine left Christianity for a while. He became a Manichaean, which was a terrible heresy. And his mother was very, very upset. She was very, a very devout Christian. And um, she would go and beg bishops and priests to talk to her son. Now, this was Augustine, who had a brilliant mind and later became a father of the church. And she would beg, please talk to my son, bring him back to the Christian faith. And finally, one bishop said to her, don't worry, there is no chance that this son of your tears will be lost. So she cried so much and prayed so much for him. Of course, he came back to the church. He became a famous saint. So we, can, we don't know what God has in store, but sometimes the, our children need to go through these phases before they can come back. And God accepts us, right, no matter what. Anybody else? You've been a wonderful audience. I want to thank Father for welcoming me in the parish of Annunciation, for welcoming me here to Rochester, to Demosthenes, and who is the, and Philip, who is helping up, upstairs? No, no, right here, Brian. Oh, right here. Brian with helping, oh, Brian, for helping upstairs with the technology. Thank you very much, and thank you for having me, and I wish you all, Galicera Costi, a wonderful Lent, and a wonderful Pascha. And again, thank Dr. Constantino, it was very, very good. wonderful to have you here. Thank as you, always. Father. Thank, you, thank you, Father. It was wonderful. Uh, also, we've added uh, we've added a couple of people watching us. Uh, so uh, Albania is now. Watching. Well, hello everybody in Albania. In Albania, and wait a minute, he's going to have me get my uh, my phone out here. So he's always uh, in. So he's texting me about new countries that have joined in. Ah, and Germany. And Germany okay. has, has uh, hello everybody us. overseas. Uh, so I know we've gotten uh, quite a quite a few views, and uh, yes. so to everybody that that's watching. Uh, thank you very, very much for tuning in and watching. This uh, will all be recorded so that any of you that would like to go back, maybe you've missed a part or you want to hear it again. Mm -hmm. So the recording will be up on our website. Demos, just give me a hand wave if that's true. That is, that is yes. uh, that's true. <laughs> but, uh, but again, thank you very, very thank much for you. taking the time and giving us something to think about thank during Thank you, Lent. Father. Thank you, Father. So everybody, again, Kalisa Arakosti, and we'll see you then tomorrow for Sunday of Orthodoxy. Absolutely. Perfect timing. All about Orthodoxy.